There's no time. O'clock. Hey, everybody. Here we are again. Don't you guys ever get sick of looking at us? I don't understand that. It's a show. <laughs> DJ Maniac says, uh, did you get a chance to listen to Love and Rockets Stones on Tail album I sent over? Yes, I listened to it yesterday. Uh, it was actually quite rad. There was a couple on there that I didn't care for. I think my favorite one was... Um, the cover of Twist, I thought that was like really cool. But that's actually one of my favorite uh, Tones on Tail songs. I, and then I was thinking to myself, maybe I liked that one the best because it sounded most like the Tones on Tail version. Because some of the other ones were kind of like wildly different than the, uh, you know, than the originals. But yeah, I think that was like the coolest one. But yeah, they were all like pretty good. I liked all those. Uh, Murder Hornet Return says, Tom, Jenny, that candy I sent was laced with LSD. This should be a fun show. I ate it. I, didn't give, <laughs> I, I ate it. I didn't give any to Jenny. You didn't? No, it wasn't very much. It was just a little, uh, what it was. It I was, didn't even know there was candy. Look at what yeah, he's doing. He's sneaking yeah, around eating yeah, candy, candy behind my back, and I didn't even get any. It was just a it Damn. Was, it was like and a, he ate some of my chocolate bunny from Easter, yeah, too. And yeah. he had his own chocolate bunny and yeah, ate all that. Yeah. And then he ate some of mine also. Yeah. That's what I do. I do that shit, kind of shit. Because you're he sent, a jerk? Yeah. He, he sent some kind of Mexican candy bar. It was uh, like uh, about the size of a about the size of a Snickers, and it had two of them, one on top of the other, and they were like long fig newtons. But instead of fig in there, they had uh, pineapple. Yeah, he said pineapple stuff. It was good, yeah. I like pineapple. It didn't taste like pineapple, though. I like pineapple. It didn't taste like pineapple, though. It actually Are you just trying to make me feel better because you no. didn't give me any? No. <laughs> what it tasted like is it tasted like um, apple. You know, like regular apple pie? That's what it tasted like. It was good, though. Yeah. Yeah. You can send more of those. I'll eat them. Yeah, that would be I'll good. I'll give some to Jetty. No, he won't. <laughs> he won't even tell me about it. Mexican candy. TV Trigger says, I know you guys likely have something planned already for the next movie review. We don't, actually. No. Um, not for the Sunday movie. We just usually do whatever. Uh, but... Blue Caprice would be a good follow-up to this episode. Yeah, there was like a fictional movie that was made about this uh, true crime case that we're talking about. Yeah, I remember when this case happened. And yeah, it was called Blue Caprice because that was the name of the car that they drove around in. Uh, I was actually going to watch the movie, but I didn't have time. I watched like a bunch of documentaries and stuff like that about it because they did like a whole bunch of ones. And I think that they had... A, what? What? She made a noise. She went... Bah! No, she's done her fighting with the little. What toy happened? Mice. We went all blurry. She, oh, okay. She's fighting with the toy mice. Oh, okay. I just heard her going. Bah! Yeah, she's fighting. <laughs> yeah, she's <laughs> throwing them. And she, yeah. But yeah, um, what was I gonna say? Oh, and I thought also there was a series that's based on this, and I think it's called I Sniper, where they interview like the younger kid, the younger guy. He's not a kid anymore, but um, the younger guy. Um, but I didn't really see that. Is that like maybe it's on HBO or something like that? But there was like a bunch of other, you know, there was some British crime shows that had covered it, some American crime shows that used to be on like Investigation Discovery or whatever. But like, you know, there was a bunch of ones that covered it. If you guys don't know the case we're talking about, I guess it's almost 20 years ago now, more than 20 years. 2002, huh? yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, 20 exactly years. 20 years ago. Had this case where he had this dude and he stuffs a kid in the back of the truck. They cut a hole, what's called a loophole. They cut a loophole in the back of the trunk, so he and they, and they covered it with a little plate, so he could shoot an AR-15 out the back of the truck, and fucking they were sniping people to serve a greater purpose, so he could get his kids back. It was, which is a weird fucking case. Yeah, um, this was super they ran bizarre. Around, ran around. It was DC, wasn't it? Well, it, some of them were DC, but it was mostly like the area around area. DC. And actually, they um, after they caught them, like they found out that they had started that spree like a whole lot earlier. Yeah. And they were went all over the fucking country. Yeah. So it was a it was a trip fucking case. Dude was a fucking stone cold fucking maniac. Not well thought out, if you ask me. But, I mean, he kind of thought he was an evil genius. I think he had some military training. The guy. He was in the military for 16 years. 16 years, yeah. yeah. But because um, the, the technique is good, all right? That's like something you'd see in a civil conflict type situation somewhere in Eastern Europe, maybe Bosnia or Chechnya or something. And uh, 
that's probably been used before. Um, but uh, just still not well thought out. I mean, it's a high human toll just to get back at your wife. There's easier ways, you know, and just... Well, obviously. It's crazy. But, yeah, the guy was, like, uh, a nutcase big time. Yeah. I mean, he had... He had a lot of problems prior to that, I feel yeah. like. Um, and I kind of feel like that whole situation with his ex-wife and the kids and everything just made him yeah. snap. Yeah. Uh, so he had a lot of, like, uh, bigger issues going on. Yeah, you had to kill all these innocent people to get your kids back. It's one yeah. of those things. Including, you see this yeah. a lot in mass shooters. Yeah. This kind of attitude that... Because sometimes they'll be not fine, but they'll be kind of, like, just normal or law-abiding prior to that. But they seem to have, like, a lot of seething resentment about shit that, you know, about, like, life kicking them and stuff like that. But it's like, look, life kicks everybody. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody in the world is against you or something like that. They always seem like they can't just be, like, oh, bad shit happens to everybody and it's like, well, that sucks, but yeah. I'll get through it. Yeah. It's always like he always needs somebody to blame. Yeah. You know what I mean? All he had to do is wait a few years, he'd get his kids back. <laughs> Because around 16, 17, they start doing whatever they want to do anyway. Yeah. So, you know, and the stupid thing about yeah. that whole thing, I mean, we'll get into this later, but yeah. the stupid thing about that was that he probably could have had more visitation with his kids if he hadn't, like, after the case where his wife got custody of them, he kidnapped them. Yeah. And, like, took, so I'm like, well, you're for sure not going to get him now. Yeah, just not well thought out. Something, something was up with him. But we're getting ahead of ourselves yeah. talking about the case. I'm just saying that, yeah. like, you see that a lot with these type of dudes that yeah. are, like, mass shooter type Not things. Well thought out. They're, they feel like, well, the world's going to pay yeah. for what one or two people did to me or what I even did to myself, you know what I mean? It's like they can't really take responsibility for yeah, their own it's actions. Always, it's always a kind of fucking thing where they fucking come up with this fucking weird fucking high effort high stress fucking mission to get something fucking simple done it it's kind of like saying man it's a whole hell of a lot of work getting out of work you know what i mean you ever, yeah. you ever somebody like that? <laughs> a, you, take, it, you gotta put, do a lot of work to get out of work you know just fucking it's just it's kind of self-defeating effort uh which always leads me to believe that that's not what they're after it's they're using that as an excuse to fucking kill a bunch of people. That's not. I don't think he gave a shit too much about the kids. I, I think it was more about I just think going he, out and killing a bunch of people. I think he just wanted to feel like power, like he could just pick off wanted people at random. People. Yeah. Well, and some of the stuff that he communicated to the cops yeah. uh, seemed to have seemed to say something like that, where I kind of feel like he maybe got off on yeah. playing God. I choose who yeah. lives and who dies. I can just go around and kill people randomly, and yeah. you know they're just going about their day doing whatever they're doing and then suddenly they you know he blows their I think it was out. mostly about that yeah I kind of feel it like it was too like I, I kind of feel like maybe the whole thing with the kids like maybe that's what started like I said maybe that's what set him off or maybe like made him crack or whatever but I think as it went on I feel like he was starting to like enjoy it enjoy the feeling yeah. of power that it gave him because he could just go around picking off like I said random ass people yeah like he was playing God deciding who lived and who died you know what I mean yep and so you know, I, I guess some people have that fucking uh, mindset. Uh, I don't, but, you know, I guess some people do. I don't get it. Uh, Line X Warrior, why does being sober have to be so dull? <laughs> Even worse, you can't uh, drown your sorrows and forget how lonely one is. God damn it. <laughs> well, it's not all, I mean, I don't know. I don't I don't really find being sober boring. Yeah. Um. And sometimes drinking a lot, like, it's fun, but then, like, the next day, I'm yeah. like, oh, why did I do that? I feel it's so job crappy. for us. Yeah, that's and We're true. usually drinking with, with people. Out in yeah. the club, usually. Yeah. We'll drink for the show, and then sometimes we're, after the show, we'll go. You know, we'll, we'll go to the club or whatever. Uh, but, you know, doing the show is kind of a social event for us. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how we think about it. We're right. just sitting around having a cocktail hour right. talking about... Talking about fucked up shit. Yeah. Or talking about nothing. Right. <laughs> Hopefully we can, uh, you know. If you're look. drowning your sorrows and loneliness, get the fuck out of the house, man. Go down to the fucking, go to a saloon or something. Go to the saloon. Go hang out with the other drugs. <laughs> go have fun. 
Tyler says, I'm pretty sure most of these higher purpose manifesto types are just bullshitting. Yeah, I'm sure they probably are. I think it's part of the fantasy. Yeah, it, the yeah, fantasy. I definitely do kind of feel like they're like they want to think they're way more important than they actually they're trying are. Trying to take center stage and grabbing the mic. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Yeah, they want it. They're like a legend in their own mind for sure. So they have to come up with all these like really crazy. Yeah, and some of them can be absolutely right. Like Ted Kaczynski was right about a lot of shit, but fucking bombing people wasn't the fucking. Sending bombs, that wasn't going to make any difference. Yeah, I'm not really sure how you get from one thing to the next thing. It's yeah. just kind of like, what did you think that that was going to solve? Yeah. See, I don't think, like you said, that was implied in your in your statement, yeah. was that I don't think they think it's going to solve anything. It's just they want to do it. They just want to do it. Yeah, Kaczynski was bombing shit because he was, he was foreseeing what is happening now with, like, the rise of... Big tech, nanotechnology, fucking technocracy, uh, taking over the world, and uh, fucking uh, kind of like a one-world type technocracy. He was foreseeing all that. NGO stuff, human, human, you know, human fucking engineering. He wasn't a dumbass. He was from Har he was from fucking Harvard. You know, he was knew what he was talking about. But there was something wrong with him. You know. Bombing heads of corporate heads of corporate offices and shit, and going after it wasn't going to stop that technocracy. That's yeah. what I mean. I just kind yeah. of feel like, look, like one dude, right, is not going to be able to like bring down all no. of society or he, nothing he like you're just not going to be able to do he, he it. He would have been a lot more effective had he put all this shit, all his work together into a big old book and written a book and then gone on tour and talked about it, seminars and shit. I mean, that Talking probably would have been more... It wouldn't have been that effective, but it'd be more, more effective, effective than, than blowing we, fucking than people up. up. Right. Information... Because now everybody's just going to think you're a fucking loon. Well, we are at loon. The, the Unabomber is I a whole from, show in and of itself. Did we do a show about the Unabomber? I don't think so. I kind of feel like I put it in the poll a couple times, got, but it know, never wins. You, know, you guys know, you know, fucking me coming from a military background and some of the best infantry units fucking... For me, man, fucking... There are a time for rifles and pistols and fucking bombs and fucking track vehicles and shit. There's a time for all that, all right? Uh, a lot of that conventional warfare has a place because sometimes you have to use it. But really, the ultimate fucking warfare, and this goes back to Operation Paperclip and the German intelligence agencies after World War II and CIA when all that shit was forming in the 50s and 60s. The ultimate fucking weapon is information warfare. Because information controls the minds of the friend and foe alike. And warfare doesn't stop until people believe that they were defeated. And that there's no hope. If you, without, and that can only be done with information. And, and, and perception. The way people perceive things. That's why propaganda and fucking control over media is very fucking important. It's how you keep the fucking rubes in line. That's how you keep the little people and all the little ants from rising up. All right. And that's why they're scared. They're constantly scared. You listen to them right now. They're panicking and begging and crying because that's all going away. Centralized information was a thing of the 20th century and even before 18th and 17th. We're heading into a damn network society and everything's democratized now. And the rich people don't like that because that's where they got, that's how they made their riches. They didn't have anything to do with right and wrong. It's just power. There is no truth. There is only power. That's that's a good thing that that's a good way of looking at things. You know, a lot of the Frankfurt School people believe that, and that is true. Um, so information warfare is fucking the ultimate. It's because it because it yields mind control, and really that's all those weapons do is control people's minds. That you defeat them, and afterwards they go, okay, that's it, the war's over. That's kind of controlling the mind. You know, they saw the defeat happen, so now they don't want to fight anymore. Well, you can do that just with words. And Kaczynski could have fucking just understood that really information warfare is a lot better than bombing people. A lot more effective. John Smith pointed out that he did write a book, The Unabomber yeah, Manifesto. But he, should, he had to go, <laughs> but he had to go out there and promote it and fucking be a... But he probably didn't have the ability, you know. Uh, they didn't have YouTube back then, so he couldn't be a guest on fucking shows or anything. You had to do it on foot, you know. But if he was so, you know, if he was so certain that fucking that the technocracy and the internet was going to take over and fucking Skynet and shit, he should have just waited until YouTube was invented and fucking Kaczynski would be out there and be a fucking number one fucking guest on all these shows. You know, he'd be popular. But he didn't have the character. 
Oh, he didn't have. He wouldn't have the social character. Yeah, he was crazy. Yeah, so crazy. he took an alternate. I mean, right. being crazy doesn't preclude people from being uh, popular on YouTube or yeah. other social media because it happens all the time. But um, you know, it's, he couldn't function well in a society. Um, he couldn't. Didn't have any personal skills. John Smith also says the IRA used the trunk sniper technique. Yeah, yeah I thought I'd seen it uh, around somewhere. Yeah, the well. fucking. Civil conflicts in, in, in mount or military operations, urbanized terrain. That's because you got mobile camouflage. It's a mobile ambush or a vehicle ambush, but it, and it's camouflaged as a civilian vehicle because that's what it is. That's the future of everything. Everything is camouflaged. Ideas are camouflaged. Armies are camouflaged. They're camouflaged as corporations. Uh, you always make a weapon look like something friendly, you know. The days of fucking big red flags with black fucking swastikas and hammers and sickles and shit. It's too obvious about what that is. They'll even camouflage that now. Rainbows and fucking unicorns and shit. You want it to look harmless, harmless, harmless. That's why you want to camouflage everything. You want to camouflage what you believe even. So that's lying, deceit, gaslighting. Posing as the enemy and speaking sock puppet accounts, fucking bots. It's just that's 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 warfare now, basically. And, it, and it, it's it's beautiful what it's doing. You see it working. Social media. You see it. I see. I understand it now. Hugo says, "I like your wig, Jenny. Thank you." Yeah. Uh, Slasher Fred says there was a movie called Phone Booth that was a sniper movie. Interestingly, interesting you bring that up because yeah. Phone Booth was actually supposed to come out right around the time that this DC sniper attack thing started happening and they were worried about it so they actually like pushed the release date back because they yeah. thought it was too similar. Lion X Warrior says uh, you, I just noticed you got 12k subscribers congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't even fucking ever. I didn't even realize no, it took about the same amount of time that it took last time. Like yeah. I said, we've been getting because I get a thing every month from YouTube that says how many sub new subscribers you got per yeah. every month and it seems like pretty steady they got us throttled i'm pretty sure they do they got us they got an algorithm on us uh, to keep us growing at a certain pace i think um you know they have select creators that are with corporate backings that grow artificially fucking huge very quickly now who knows if those are real subscribers though on the on those channels because they don't seem to have the interaction but you know Hard to say. Tyler says, I'm imagining YouTuber Ted asking people to donate to his Patreon, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think fucking, I think he'd have been great. I think he'd have been a great, uh, but he didn't have the character you need for to be an entertaining host. You know what I mean? But he probably would have been a pretty interesting guest on a lot of fucking um, conspiracy theory type programs. Which I wouldn't say it was a theory, a, a conspiracy theory. It, it happened, a, a lot of the stuff Ted Kaczynski was talking about. He was just talking about the, a, growing, a growing civilization that would fucking be bad. You know what I mean? Kind of anti-democratic, kind of autocratic technocracy. Which has been brewing for fucking centuries, really. Industrial Revolution. Well, the thing is that yeah. even if you're right about some things, that doesn't mean you're not a fucking nutcase, though. Exactly. Well, the thing is, is he was a nutcase, but he was smart. He was he was in yeah. Harvard. But like I said, that doesn't mean yeah, those two things yeah. are not mutually exclusive. Right, right. You can be smart and be be fucking dangerous and and fucking and he was kind of cantankerous. We're talking about another case. It's okay. Yeah, but he was he was <laughs> he was he was evidently not pleasant to be around. So I don't think he would have fucking made a very good YouTube guest. Uh, not with his attitude. He was just kind of, and he didn't take a shower. He was dirty, you know, and fucking, he was kind of bum. He was like a bum living out in the fucking shacks and shit. Living off the grid. Yep. Murder Hornet Return says the guy who shot Reagan is selling out music shows now. Is he really? Yeah. I hadn't followed that, guys. I thought that guy, I thought that dude was dead. No, he's out. Oh, oh, okay. He was crazy. Well, yeah, he's clearly really They eventually crazy. released his ass. Yeah, because shit, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? That yeah, was, what, 1980? Yeah, he did that to impress Jodie Foster. Yeah. Little did he know Jodie Foster's a lesbian. Well, and like, how, <laughs> like, why would you even think that anyway? Even if she was just like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. You shot a president for me? Yeah, he, he was trying to get okay. her attention. I love you. Dude's yeah. got some weird ways of thinking about shit. He's crazy. <laughs> 
That's crazy. That's fucking weird. Well, he probably thought that you know he, he you know Reagan was a Republican. And he probably figured that fucking Jody Foster was a Democrat, and fucking maybe Jody Foster or the Democrats at the time were talking about how bad Reagan was. So if he shoots Reagan, he's a hero in Jody Foster's eyes. I got him for you. You know, crazy. They're fucking yeah, crazy. Yeah, that's very crazy. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. Got a little fucking nuance, dude. Uh, I'd love to see Soraya interview Ted. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> that would be funny. I like Soraya, man. Soraya, I do, too. Soraya has, he, he's a real good host. He's a real good host. Got a good voice, too. That kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, John Smith says, so his bombing campaign was the ultimate guerrilla marketing for his book. Yeah. Yeah, I guess pretty you could much. say kind of. <laughs> but it didn't it didn't yield it didn't work really it didn't stop the technocracy it didn't didn't fucking really make didn't cause his book to sell and he ended up being a pariah it it's he was trying to, he could have only won his war in an in using information warfare and bombing somebody is not information warfare he should have become a master of information warfare he should have just been what is that noise that's weird, what? It? it sounds like static. I think it's my maybe it's my speaker over there. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. has been like making. Oh, some... you know what it is? is it oh, that fucking noise making machine. I thought that was off. That's on. Maybe maybe you I, maybe you hit it or something. Yeah, I didn't touch it. I have a white noise machine up yeah, there. Yeah. It was like making some kind. Of, I thought Pookie was trying to like get out of the room or something yeah. like that, like scratching on the door. Um, he should have been uh, doing things to kind of like exposing them and everything, but like I said, he would have needed the internet, and it really wasn't around at that point. He'd, the early internet, I, I guess, was when they caught him. He just he didn't play, his, and he didn't have electricity in his shack anyway, so he couldn't use the internet. Yeah, you know, I mean, what are you gonna do? He was crazy. Yeah, and as I said, that's kind of what. You know, when we went off on that tangent, I was like, yeah. one of the things is that, yeah, they can have all these grandiose ideas and shit like that, but yeah. in the end, they just want to blow up innocent people yeah. to make their dick hard or, like, make them feel powerful. That's really all it comes down to. He was delusional. Yeah, I mean, you can come up with all the fucking, yeah. uh, you know, post hoc fucking reasoning you want, yeah. but, I mean, you enjoy it. You want to blow up people. You get off on it. You know? All the other shit is just uh, I think he kinda, justification. Well, I think I think Kaczynski kind of saw himself as kind of like the guy from um, V from Vendetta. He's a guy living in nature, fighting people who are capitalists who are destroying the earth and uh, you know that that kind of stuff, uh, and bringing in a fucking high tech, fucking totalitarian kind of a regime, and. And he's out there fighting the good fight. That's what he thought. But he's delu he was delusional. You know? Yeah. yeah. Lion X Warrior says, uh, I agree with Tom about the algorithm shenanigans because, like I said, around Christmas time, you guys have a type of cult status with my kids' generation. Really? They all are familiar with you guys, which is hilarious because so we're we old no as idea. fuck. We're old as fuck. We don't know anything that we have kids and kids, <laughs> kids listening to us for fucking... Which is very strange, but... Well, Christmas like, time. Why Christmas time? Well, he's, he's just saying that's when he said that. Mm. Uh, back around Christmas time. Well, yeah, that's the funny thing, and it's like, and the well, the weird thing about it is like, I I subscribe to channels of people with like, of all different ages. Like, yeah. I just, just depending on what the interest is. Like, if they review cool like books I like or movies I like or they talk about horror shit or whatever, um, then I'll watch them. I don't really think about how old they are. So maybe I don't. Maybe I don't know. Like maybe kids are like that too. But uh, the thing about it though is that even a lot of channels that I'm really into that to me like seem really popular because they get like a lot of uh, comments and stuff. They have about the same uh, number of subscribers as we have or sometimes less. Yeah. Like actually some channels I really like only have like five or 6,000, yeah. which I don't know what that says, but. I like, uh, I like a bunch of different channels. I listen to them for different reasons. Uh, I like Midnight's Edge a lot, really good. Uh, uh, the Gathering, I like that channel. Um, I like Tim Pool. I like uh, We Are Change. Uh, I like uh, which are kind of like independent reporters. They'll actually go on location and do stuff. Uh, Fleckus Fleckus talks, I think is what his name is, or Fleckus speaks. That motherfucker's funny as shit. Um, he just talks to protesters, and he interviews them fucking nice, and he just lets them say what they want to say. That's hilarious. Um, I like uh, there's a bunch of them. I like. Um, Myth Vision, 
which is that's mythicism. They'll have guests on. Dr. Price will be on. They'll have all kinds. They had a guy who was on today or yesterday, I think it was today, talking about Manichaeism. And uh, I didn't really know much about the Manichaeans. They're really good. It was like a mix, East, East versus West mix down in fucking Persia and Greece during, you know, third century. And it's, it's a lot like, it's probably where they got the idea of fucking the Jedi and fucking the Force and everything. Because they kind of believed in the same. It was, it was a fusion of Christianity, Zoroastrianism, and Buddhism, and Taoism from China. It's all happening there. Really good show. You guys should watch that. Um, uh, and I was going, man, I must be a Manichaean. But, uh, <laughs> so I, I like a lot of different kinds of shows, you know what I mean, that are kind of independent. I don't like a corporate type stuff, you know. Um, Fucking uh, Ruben Report, pretty good. Um, fucking little, uh, what's his name? Little guy who did Dear Reader. Little gay guy, little gay Russian guy. He's fucking really good. Genius. He had genius work on, on North Korea. One of the only persons in the West that truly understands North Korea, because I was on the DMZ fucking uh, in, in Korea and fucking used to get, used to see North Koreans. Fucking those, Camp Greaves. It, my old camp is now a museum for a DMZ museum. The, the uh, Garpo's Collier, which I did a mission at Garpo's Collier, was actually demolished. I watched them do it, video of it. They blew it up. They blew it up. The goddamn it, they blew it up. <laughs> they blew up my old guard post. And it was just made out of fucking solid concrete. Fucking rebar reinforced. It was nuclear hardened fucking guard post. It's weird. Tyler says, I've been watching you guys for a few years. I'm 20 and started yeah. at about 16 or so. Oh, no shit. Yeah, see, I never would have known see, that. See, we don't like, have any idea. Guys, we'll, yeah, we I just assumed because of like all the shit people. that we talk about yeah. and because of all the tangents we go off on, we're just like, remember back in the day in the 80s? Yeah, we assume it's all old people. So I just assume it was like people the yeah. same age as me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that's dumb to assume that, but it's just kind of like... I don't know. So, because even, you know, some of you guys that, like, make comments about certain movies and stuff like that, like, from the 70s or whatever, I just assume you're my age, but maybe not. Yeah. Because, like I said, a lot of uh, channels that I watch that are horror movies and horror books and stuff like that, they're all into, like, old shit. So, yeah. You know what I mean? I kind of so know can never what it tell. is. When, when we were your age, we were listening to people, too. Fucking, I used to just fucking fr trip out fucking dialing in with old FM radio try and AM radios trying to listen to fucking Art Bell. And man, his shows, you, they're now starting to put them up on YouTube and, 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 and not taking them down. I don't know why they used to take them down, but they're up there now. Coast to coast, AM. Well, because yeah. probably whoever owned the copyright was like, get that off of there. Yeah, it's not, they're, they're not tripping about it now. Because they used to do that with the Unsolved yeah. Mysteries, because people used to yeah. upload the Unsolved Mystery shows, and right. they used to always take them down because of the copyright, but now they've put them up legally, like yeah. on Tubi and stuff, so... All of Art Bell's shows were recorded. They're all recorded. They're out there. It's just that they kept taking them off of fucking YouTube. I've listened to them recently. They're... I listened to a bit of them. They're still fucking real comforting to listen to. The topics are uh, real passe by today's standards. But man, when you were listening to them back in the day, in the early internet age or even the pre-internet age, um, you weren't really quite... It was society was a little more of a low information society you weren't really you really weren't really aware of what was true or not you were constantly trying to figure out what was actually true <laughs> and he'd come up with some weird shit like the star child skull and you could really kind of only imagine it and then eventually the internet came out and you could fucking look at it and go oh that's what he's talking about um and uh, art was a fucking master entertainer it didn't matter how ridiculous his guest was. He took that guest seriously, and he made that guest feel fucking honored to be on the show. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The guy would fucking be taught, say some crazy shit and fucking art. You don't say. And, and it actually, would, for something about art, he would give the fucking topic a, an air of... Well, because he didn't come out and say, you're full of shit. Yeah, he never did that. No, about? no. He was always at least entertained the possibility, even though it already was contradicting with everything else, you know, it would contradict with everything else we knew would be true. It was just, 
they were fun shows to listen to. Like dudes would show up saying that in the in their backyard they have a hole that goes all the way down to hell. For and, some reason, I remember that one like yeah, more than anything. That one's that me. that one and the elevator to Mars. Elevator one. to Mars, yeah, and fucking a hole. That went because down I'm to listening hell. to that, and the guy's like totally serious. I'm like, yeah. dude, dude. Yeah, elevator to Mars. Somebody needs to put that. that dude said he had a way. hole in the backyard, and he fucking and, and he didn't know how far how far down it went. And he was trying to measure it. He never could fucking figure out how deep it was. He was throwing things down in it. Eventually, he put a microphone down there. And fucking when he pulled it up, they played the recording. And it's a bunch of people screaming like in hell and shit. It was fucking great. Absolutely great. You're listening to it fucking back in the fucking early, back in the 90s. I guess it was mid-90s, maybe 93 or something. Might have been 94. No, it might have been later. I can't. I I think it might have been around 96. And you're listening to it going, God damn, that's some spooky shit. Imagine if you did have a hole that went down to fucking hell, you know. And then the Mueller sky car. They talked about the Mueller sky car for years. It turned out Mueller was fucking embezzling all the money and fucking cheating everybody. The, the thing, the things never really, it, it flew a little bit, but now these fucking little drones can fly. You can do that shit easily. They have a thing like the Mueller sky car now. I'm looking at the four props on it. If they want a hundred thousand for it, but it's all just electric powered. Well, that's the thing. Everybody, everybody just kind of wanted shit that was like mysterious and creepy. And yeah, it was like another that. era. But, it was fun know. though. Yeah, it was had fun. That fucking, it, had that dude show up fucking talking about Sidonia on Mars. I forgot that dude's name. Yeah, we did a show about that a while back. Hoagland, yeah, he, was it Hoagland? Hoagland, yeah, Richard C. Hoagland, and he would just go on with these fucking hokey ass fucking satellite photos of Mars saying if you look here you can see that this and he's describing it as if it's buildings and fucking cities and shit but no that's not what it was now they have fucking landers and HD shit down there it's just just hills it was cool though your imagination would run wild with you yeah yeah, maybe there was cities there millions of years ago I'm not that imaginative (laughs) I was I'm like man shut up you don't know what you're talking about I was well, was, said, the well, photos weren't quite clear enough. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. To where you, they weren't they weren't so clear that you could deny it. You could like, yeah, maybe maybe that maybe that is a ruin. You know, wouldn't that be neat? But that was the fun of those shows. You know, yeah. that was the fun of them. Rebecca says, back with coffee and crumpets with butter and Vegemite. I'll be awake proper soon. Oh, yeah, shit. it's uh, it's morning there. That's bre- it's breakfast time. Yeah, everybody's talking about coast to coast. Which is crazy. How great coast to coast. John Smith said, I remember the face on Mars being a big thing in other yeah. circles for a while. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It still is. I kind of, I mean, you know, the, the circles of, of nutters is getting smaller and smaller, like yeah. at, at least concerning that issue. Um, but then they move over to another issue. They move over to the next bullshit thing. Yeah. But um, yeah, the clearer the pictures get, they're just kind of like, oh, I guess it's not a face after all. What other wacky shit can I believe in? Then they move over. Yeah. <laughs> to something else. Yeah, fourth down said, turned out space is quite boring. Exactly, exactly. I hate to say, but it is kind of boring. <laughs> no, it's not boring. I mean, it's not boring, it's but not boring. it's just there's not, like, all the fantastical shit that people, like, there's some shit. There's some shit going on on fucking Venus right now. There's uh, some gases in the uh, upper atmosphere of Venus that m- might indicate that there's life there in the in the upper atmosphere of Venus. That's some weird shit. But we're talking about microbial life. Well, yeah. Because there's a band inside the Venus's fucking upper atmosphere that has Earth-like temperatures and almost Earth-like fucking, you know, it's an Earth-type atmosphere and temperatures and pressures. Where something where a microbe could live in it, blowing around in there. And the question, and, and there's some gases that may mean that there's some kind of uh, microbes. Because uh, the gas, I'm trying to remember what gas it was. That particular gas is fucking uh, associated with microbial fucking basically waste waste gases. That's some big shit. But here's the thing: let's say you find microbial life in the upper atmosphere of Venus. Chances are, you take a DNA sample of it. It's probably Earth life, because material's been traded through all these planets over millions of years. They're contaminating each other. So. I mean, there's a chance you might be able to find some life on Mars, and it's from Earth, deep down underneath the soil. Because meteors trade and yeah. hit each other back and forth. 
All right. So, are we ready to actually get to the topic mm -hmm. now, or what? Let's get to it. Okay. So, we got... Okay, so what I'm going to do... I got a little summary at first, like, if you don't know anything about the case. And then what I'm going to do, even though there were, like, some murders and crimes prior to, you know, the main event, if you want to call it that. But I kind of want to go into it from, like, the DC sniper attacks proper, which happened in October of 2002, and then go through that, because they didn't know who it was at that time. And then after they caught them, um, then I kind of want to go back and talk about them, like, as individuals, and also about all the other shit that they did prior that they found out about afterward. Okay, so that was kind of like the the order that I had it in. It seemed like a lot of the documentaries I watched had it in that kind of order, and that's just like the order that sort of made sense to me. Because I was gonna do like a timeline, like all this kind of stuff, but then I was kind of like, eh, I'll I'll do it this way because I kind of feel like they kind of came onto the, you know, onto the scene like with the DC sniper attacks. All right, so uh, in case you don't know, a little bit of a summary. As I said, this happened in October of two thousand and two. Uh, usually called DC sniper attacks or the Beltway sniper attacks. Um, these were a bunch of, uh, as advertised, uh, a bunch of just random sniper attacks on random civilians uh, over a three-week period uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, also surrounding area Maryland and Virginia. During this particular uh, phase, uh, there were 10 people killed, three others wounded, uh, along Interstate uh, 95 in Virginia and along the, you know, Baltimore, Washington metropolitan area. Uh, so there ended up being two shooters, one of them a 41-year-old man named John Allen Muhammad, one of them a 17-year-old boy named Lee Boyd Malvo, uh, and they got caught, like, later on. Now, when they caught them, they found out that they had actually started their spree, like, way back in Feb February of 2002, and that there were at least seven other deaths attributed to them prior to the shit that happened in D.C. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I don't know if we want to spoil the ending, but... Um, no, they caught the guys. Uh, yeah, they caught them. Yeah. Um, and uh, John Allen Muhammad was actually uh, sentenced to death, and he was actually executed in 2009. Uh, Malvo is, was a juvenile when they caught him, uh, but he got, like, uh, six life sentences. Yeah, he's not going anywhere. And he's uh, still in there. Like, he's trying to, like, appeal some shit, but uh, he's still in there. He was down to the influence of an older guy. Yeah, we'll get into that. But, we'll get into come that. Come on, man. You know murder's wrong. And, um, although people change a lot over time. I'm not going to say that the guy couldn't be paroled, maybe, but uh, maybe middle age. And when he's too old to, like, do anybody well, any when harm. he's outside, when he's outside the fucking danger zone. Maybe middle age, and maybe they can make him a fucking trustee or something, let him out or something. Uh, it did happen. When, you could say he was almost kind of like a, a victim of a cult in a certain way. It did seem yeah. a little bit, and I'm not excusing him. Yeah. Um, it did seem a little bit like that. It almost seemed a little bit like he was kind of groomed, kind of brainwashed a little bit, and brainwashed a little bit. Um, he was probably old enough to to know better, but in some ways, he was kind of vulnerable. Also, you, you can do that to an adult. You can fucking get an adult fucking fired up to do fucking illegal shit and go out and kill people. Man. Yeah, it depends on the person, have been doing and it forever. well, it depends on the person, and yeah. it depends on your interaction with them, and it yeah. depends on you know their personality, what and kind of like if you're able to kind of get to their weaknesses and stuff like that. So he I'm not saying selected, I'm not saying that he shouldn't be punished. I'm just saying that maybe if he had been left to his own devices he might not have done this shit on his own. No, he wouldn't have. I don't think he no, would have, because no. he seemed like a fairly normal kid. Pretty regular for, for for where he came from. But So this is kind of the same no. kind of thing that we bring up whenever it's like serial killer couples and stuff like that. There's usually, not always, but there's usually one that's like way more gung-ho, and then the other one like kind of talks them into some shit. You know? And I kind of feel like that was the situation here. Now, even though when they first caught him when he was still 17, uh, he was all still under the influence and he was, you know, talking about how awesome it was and shit like that. But recently, um, you know, everybody that knows him or like people that have interviewed him in prison and stuff like that said he's like a completely total... Yeah, change. Yeah, they said he's like, he's like apologized to all the victims. He said I was a monster back then, stuff like that. So, so he seems to have gotten away from it like 20 years later, but I don't know. I don't really know how I feel about it. Like I said... 
he was a kid, but 17 is old enough to know better. So I'm like really, I'm really on the fence about Some that. Some people don't develop, they aren't, aren't very well developed. Yeah, and like I said, he didn't have, you know, he, had, he was a very vulnerable as, person. I look back at myself at 17, I was pretty advanced and I was still dumb. Yeah, I was dumb at 17. Most people are dumb at yeah. 17. That's why I'm willing to like give him a little bit of leeway because, you know, even though what he did was fucking horrifying and I would never excuse it, but he was a kid. Well, he's pushing almost 40 now. Yeah, that, yeah. That yeah, was about time to let him out, probably. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they could let him out. Just, like, just fucking keep an you eye on keep him. Keep an eye on keep him for a while. Keep fucking eye on him. Holy yeah. shit. Well, we'll have to see what it is. I mean, look, he was 17 under the influence of a fucking evil man. And, uh, yeah, he was fucked up. He did it. He did time. There may be there's something where he, you know, they might be able to put him in some kind of weird halfway house for a while and just see how he does. And see how, how he does. does. Yeah. And then if he fucks sure. up again. Yeah, because I'm real, I don't know, I'm real iffy about, we've done shows about like child killers and stuff like that. And I'm not even talking about 17 year olds because that's almost an adult. But I'm talking about like fucking 10 and 12 year old kids. Yeah. And some of those people like did shit that was so fucking evil that it's like I'm not really sure but then the thing about it is like they're a kid it's like I kind of think about what I was like when I was 12 or 17 or whatever I didn't kill anybody obviously but you know you do dumb shit and like when you're an adult like when you're almost 50 you're kind of like a completely different person yeah I can barely relate to some of the things that I believed in you know when I was 17 right it was like it was somebody else a lot of the stuff, like, you know, Gramptress is on here. He knew me at that age. I, I was still the same person. But you're dumb, man, at 17. Yeah, like I said. I you're not of... operating with the fucking full information at that time. Well, your you brain's not that... really done cooking until, yeah. like, you're in your mid-20s or and, thereabouts. At least. And then you don't, you don't have enough life experience to understand. Yeah. You can't put things in perspective, you know. Yeah, everything's, like, the world's biggest deal, you know? Yeah. And I remember that. Like, right. I remember feeling, like, I don't feel like that anymore, but I remember feeling like that. Like, when you were a teenager, everything was the end of the fucking world, you know? Right. Like, everything was, like, this big fucking drama. Like, you thought, like, if a bad yeah. thing happened, it's like, nothing's ever gonna be right. good ever again. It was just like that. And, like, almost all teenagers are like that. That's why fucking old Dylan and fucking, what's his name from the fucking, from the fucking school shooting, where was that? The, the Columbine The people. Columbine shooting. Yeah, that's that's what mode they were in. Everything was a big fucking deal. Had they fucking just graduated two or three years later, they'd have forgotten all about fucking high school. They'd have been in the club. Yeah, and we talked about that when we did yeah. the Columbine show because I was just kind of like, all they had to do, I, like I understand, yeah. like I don't understand what they did because I'm not going to shoot up a school for Christ's sake. But even and I wouldn't have done it back then either. They thought everybody was after them and they were getting revenge. revenge right, and that's yeah. see, that's another yeah. thing, and that's kind of like the yeah. same mindset that I'm talking about here. Where it's people that can't deal with just the regular vicissitudes of life. I mean, bad yeah. shit happens to everybody. Everybody gets fucked over. Everybody, it's nobody's fault, necessarily. Um, you know, sometimes it is. Well, but some of it is because you're too fucking sensitive. Well, it, it could be that, it's too. But Well, the yeah. thing about it, too, is that sometimes it's just circumstances. It's yeah. not because somebody has like a, is out to get you. I mean, sometimes it is, but it's like... I kind of feel like people that have this type of mindset that think like the whole world's against them or everyone's picking on them. It's like, and I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. Like, cause sometimes, you know, the Columbine kids might've been bullied or something like that, but it's like the whole world isn't out to get you. It's just like, you know, it's maybe one motherfucker or a handful of motherfuckers. And it's like, those people are not really important in the grand scheme of things. So you just, I know it's hard, but you just can't like let that get to you to a point where you're just gonna ruin your entire life to get back at them. And you're really not getting back at anybody. I mean, in in the long term. And that's, again, this is just like, if the, you know, the DC snipers, if, you know, if John Muhammad, if his ultimate goal or his whatever he thought he was doing was, hey, I'm going to get back at my ex-wife. I'm like, that's not what you're doing, though. You're not taking revenge on her by killing a bunch of... I think he wanted to, like, wanted to cover it up. So, like, if he killed, he was going to kill her and then make it look, like, random and he would get away with it. But, like I said, that seems like a really stupid way of going about it. You're not getting revenge on the world 
It's like you're just a little person, just like everybody else. Nobody really cares that much about you. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, please get over yourself. I kind of feel like it's this really, really weird. It's like this really weird, everybody's picking on me, but that's also kind of like a weird kind of narcissism because you think that everybody gives a shit what you're up to or like gives a shit what you're doing. And I guarantee you that hardly anybody does. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? So you're not like getting getting revenge on anybody. You're not owning anybody. You're not doing anything like that like you think you're doing. You're just being a dick for like no, no reason. Okay, so let's do the timeline of the DC area sniper attacks. And then, I, like I said, then we'll go back in time and like talk about the, the earlier shit that they did that they found out about later. So the first thing that happened, uh, Wednesday, October 2nd, 2002, about 5.20 uh, in the afternoon, there was shot fired through a window of a Michael's craft store. Uh, and this was in Aspen Hill in the sort of DC area. Uh, which I think it's like a suburb outside of DC. I'm not, I've been to DC, but I'm not real familiar with all the suburbs around there. Now, so somebody shot in the window. Now, the bullet didn't hit anybody, thankfully. Uh, it went right by this uh, a woman that worked there, a cashier named Ann Chapman. Uh, but that was pretty much as far as it went. Like, so nobody got injured that uh, particular time. So the cops came and shit like that, but, you know, nobody got hurt. And so they were just kind of like, oh, maybe it was an accident. Somebody's gun went off, blah, blah, blah. So they didn't really, like, make a big deal about it. But about an hour after that, 6.30 p.m., there was a 55-year-old man named James Martin. He was a program analyst. And he was coming out of a grocery store, a shopper's food warehouse, which is in Wheaton, and he was walking to his car, like, in the parking lot, and a shot kind of came out of nowhere, and it got him, like, right in the chest, and he was killed pretty much immediately. One of the documentaries that I saw, like, had the all the 911 calls of, like, the people calling in for... So, like, a woman that was in the parking lot, too, like, she saw him fall down and had heard the gunshot, and she was, like, ducking behind her car with her little... She had, like, a little five-year-old kid, and she was calling, being... They're like, hey, they bleeding. She's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm behind the fucking car. Jesus Christ, just get here. But, yeah, so there was that. So then, the next day, uh, Thursday, October 3rd, um, four people shot in the morning, and then one shot in the evening. So five people uh, dead on October 3rd. Now, the first one happened at 7.41 a.m., this was a, thank you. This was a 39 year old uh, man named James L. Buchanan, uh, better known as Sonny, that was his nickname. He was a landscaper uh, and he was shot dead near Rockville, Maryland. He was actually mowing the lawn uh, at a business. That was like part of his job, you know. And somebody just came along and shot him. And again, the 911 call, like his neighbor called and at first he thought, because this was, you know, DC is kind of like a sort of higher crime area, but like the suburbs around DC are actually like really low crime because uh, they tend to be like a little bit more affluent. So nobody, I mean, I read somewhere that these, the DC sniper attacks in this county or whatever, just those made the crime rate go up like 30% or something like that, just from that. Because there's like, they, we have like maybe a couple murders a year and all of a sudden we have like five in one day type of thing. So nobody thought the dude had been shot. Like the, the, his neighbor called and said, I think his, what, what did he say? He said, I think his lawnmower exploded because all he saw was the dude laying down the lawnmower running and then there was blood everywhere. So he just thought, he didn't think the dude had been shot, but yeah, so they got there and found out, but uh, he was dead at the scene. 8.12 AM, uh, there was a 54 year old man, uh, Prem Walekar, Prem Kumar Walekar, he was a taxi cab, taxi cab driver. Uh, he was also killed in Aspen Hill in Montgomery County while pumping gas into his taxi at a mobile station. Uh, and you had to watch because gas stations were uh, kind of a target. Like a bunch of people were killed while they were pumping gas. Let me say something real quick. What's that? Um, I'm trying to see who it was that said it. Um, John says that Columbine guys weren't bullied. One was suicidal under the influence of a psychopath. Yeah. We did uh, a show on, on them already. And I mentioned it in the show that when I was living in past Christian, Mississippi, my first wife, we a couple that were friends of ours, he owned a comic book store uh, that was on in, in Long Beach, Mississippi. Um, 
he w- he graduated from Columbine High School. He had graduated from that high school about five or six years before the shooting happened. And he gave me a lot of background on the way that that school was. That The teachers and that community and everything was what I was going to call, say that they were very class conscious in a negative way. Okay. They were new money. They didn't like outsiders and they liked very conventional people. That... Those two guys kind of came from a clique of kind of like prototype goth type industrial kids and just kind of misfits. And um, that they were kind of, they, I wouldn't say they were bullied in a physical way, but they were kind of, people looked down their noses at them like they were unusual. They didn't like them. And evidently a lot of, a lot of the fucking weird shit that happened to those kids didn't come from the students. It was, uh, some of it was from the teachers. And then the teachers backing up the students. There's a big thing about the white hats and the jocks and shit were fucking with them. And so it was like class warfare. Nobody said that they were bullied. It's just that uh, they weren't bullied in a conventional way. It's just that they were being slighted a lot. And uh, they just were going to strike back. They hated that school and the people in that school other than their friends. Am I saying it's right? No, it's not right. But we don't live in a world of right and wrong. We live in a world of fucking people doing whatever it is the fuck they want to do. <laughs> you know? Um, and people get hurt. I mean, uh, my... Any... You yeah, go ahead. My high school was similar yeah. uh, in that it was kind of upper middle class kids. And right. The teachers were fine, but, um, you know, if you weren't like a blonde cheerleader type or a jock or something like that, you did kind of... Yeah. You got picked on a lot. Right. Well, what was weird about fucking if you were poor. Harris and Klebold is that they weren't poor. Their parents were of the same class as everybody else. It's just that they didn't fucking like upper middle class American culture. They liked fucking subcultures. You know, they liked Cam FDM and some of the industrial stuff. They would have been hanging out in a club with us. All right. That, that's we, we have a lot of people like that. You know, or that's that same thing. You know, they're upper middle class, but you wouldn't know it. They're just like their own thing. They don't like they, they're swimming against the current. You know, especially back in those days. Today it's very different. Uh, the fucking American society is a lot more open than it was back in the nineties. Okay, so I'm not justifying what they did. It's just you have to know the background. The, well, it's always better to understand stuff. Yeah. But yeah. understanding something is not excusing right. it. I mean, these pe- I'd, I'd fucking walk around past Christiane in Mississippi. These people wouldn't know me from Adam, wouldn't know that fucking, you know, my family was from Mississippi for fucking generations and shit. And they would look at me sideways because I didn't dress like them. You know what I mean? You had that too. But I could put them in their place because, you know, I knew the culture. So, I understand it. It's just that you don't go out and shoot for school. You know, you're in fucking school, you know what I mean? <laughs> the game changes once you're out of school. It's just that they weren't, they didn't have any older mentors, I, don't, I think, that they would listen to, you know? So I said in that show back then, had they known me, I'd have straightened them fucking right up. I'd have straightened them bitches up. I said, look, just chill. Don't fucking be fucking crazy. Because they wouldn't listen to adults outside their little fucking scene. Tyler says, uh, can he realistically get paroled? Are we talking about Malvo? Um, no, not with six life sentences. Probably not, no. but well, the, he has been doing like appeals because they did yeah. overturn a couple things because there was a law passed in Virginia that uh, said you couldn't like give somebody a life. I can't remember like what the um, exact thing was, but it's like somebody that committed crimes before they were 17 or before they were, uh, when they were still a minor, like you couldn't give them a life sentence or there was some kind of thing. But the thing about it is that they committed crimes in a whole bunch of different states. So it wouldn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. So it wouldn't really matter if like one law was overturned or one sentence was overturned because there's still like a bunch of other states right. that he committed crimes. Yes, in. Yes. That makes it a lot harder. So I don't think that I don't know. I mean, you know, he's young still. I don't know if it's, it, it might be feasible when he's like an old man, but his, Best prospects for him at the age he is in now and the legal status and being across, having fucking homicides in several states, depending on what the Department of Corrections is like in the state that he's in, sometimes there are special programs where 
they have like class A style statewide trustees where a person they'll take a guy like that who's a special case um, because <coughs> it happened when they were young and it was a big case and this and this happened you know and there's some kind of, hey, you know, he was kind of young when that happened. These other people kind of made him do it. It's a famous case. He's well known. Sometimes they can do something like uh, release him almost kind of like as a fucking ward of the state where he sleeps uh, at a fucking jail, a local jail, or he has a room at a certain state facility and he's something like a janitor or um, working at a police station, fucking on cars. There's all kinds of stuff that they can do. Uh, they got guys with life sentences that do that kind of stuff where they're not in a prison, but they work for the state and they can't really leave state facilities. That's, that's one thing that certain states do that. So it's like a real high level trustee. But usually the guys that do that have life sentences. They kind of grew up in prison they don't really get that shot until they're in their 40s. Because they got nowhere to go. They can't run. Where are they going to go? They can't survive as this fucking civilian. They, they take care of them. You know what I mean? Fucking, they feed them, clothe them, house them. They can't get a job. They don't have an identity. You know? We're going to apply for a job. They don't have a fucking ID card. You know? If they were to run, they'd be reapprehended in months. You know? year or so but uh, that's but a lot of those guys won't run because then they lose all those privileges you know but they'll probably do something like that for them eventually all right so going back to october 3rd as i said uh we've already had two people killed on october 3rd uh the third victim happened at 8 37 a.m this is a 34 year old woman named sarah ramos she was a housekeeper and she was killed outside of the Leisure World Shopping Center uh, in Norbeck. She had actually just gotten off a bus and was sitting on a bench reading a book, uh, waiting for another bus or waiting for a ride. And somebody just came along and shot her in the head. 9.58 a.m., uh, another woman named Lorianne Lewis Rivera, uh, she was 25, killed while vacuuming, vacuuming out her minivan uh, at a shell station. Somebody just came along and shot her. So those were the four that happened in the morning. Then the same day, 9.20 p.m., uh, there was another shooting. Pascal Charlot, who was 72 years old, he was a retired carpenter, and he was just uh, walking down the street. And somebody came along and shot him. Uh, he died about an hour later. Now, what they determined, as I said, the first shooting, they were just kind of like, I mean, they did have, like, some of the investigators on, like, in some of the documentaries I was watching, and they were just kind of like, well, when they had the first shooting happen, or the one that happened in the parking lot, they were just kind of like, yeah, maybe that's just random, or maybe somebody was just targeting that dude, but they still kind of had a feeling that it's like, this seems like it's probably not good, um, you know what I mean? So they were kind of waiting for something else to happen, you know what I mean? Uh, but it wasn't really until October 3rd that they realized that there was somebody just going around, like, targeting people. Uh, they didn't know if it was random at first. They thought maybe there was some kind of pattern or some kind of something. They were looking for something. Um, but in each of the shootings, uh, the victims were always killed by a single bullet, uh, fired from some distance away. And interestingly, nobody saw anything. Like, they didn't know at the time that they were shooting, that there was a two-man team that were shooting from a car that had been modified in what they called a quote-unquote rolling sniper's nest. They didn't know that at the time. So they were kind of like, well, are these people hiding in the bushes? Or they, you know, they, they thought maybe they were in a car, but they did actually figure out at this point, they're like, well, maybe they are in a car, so that, which means there's probably two of them. You know what I mean? Because it's like these, this isn't just like a drive-by. These are like very, very tactical like everybody was hit in the chest or the head like with one shot so it so there was that now obviously um everybody like the public started to flip out at this point as you would because they didn't as i said they knew that there was somebody going around targeting people but at this point they're like look this is like all over the map it's men it's women it's old people it's young people it's all it's white people it's black it's indian it's like it's all different races so it didn't look like anybody was 
targeting anyone specifically. They were just kind of like going around, like taking whatever opportunity presented itself, which obviously is terrifying because that means you that could be anybody you know what i mean you could just be like hanging out doing whatever and somebody just like walks by and shoots you and that's essentially what happened to all of these people so at this point they have a um they kind of have a thing like the guy that was sort of at least in montgomery county uh the chief of police charles uh moose he kind of like took over the whole thing and you know, they were kind of talking about maybe closing the schools and shit like that. But they're like, well, we'll keep the schools open. But they had to like they wouldn't let the kids go outside like they had to kept the shades down, shit like that. And then uh, after there was another shooting at the gas station. So it's like they started putting tarps like so people could pump gas without people seeing them like driving by shit like that. Now, uh, interestingly, there were a couple of kind of like sort of false leads at this point. As I said, they didn't really have much evidence to go by. They didn't really have any witnesses. Uh, nobody saw much of anything. Nobody, they didn't find any shell casings or anything like that until later. Now, they did actually have a witness that said, oh, I saw um, a, a, like a white panel truck after one of the murders. Um, but this turned out to kind of be a false lead. Now, interestingly, one witness did say that they'd seen a blue Chevy Caprice, which, uh, spoiler alert, was the car that the snipers were driving. Um, but that was kind of like, that worked out that they stopped the car a couple times, but blah, blah. But they were kind of like focusing on the white panel truck because a couple other witnesses reported that. I don't know why that happened, but yeah. Um, they did figure out that the murders were all carried out with a uh, 223 caliber rifle. Now, at this point, uh, the snipers started going farther afield. Uh, you know, it, at this point, it was kind of like D.C. and just like the surrounding suburbs. But now they're kind of going farther out and there's like a couple of days in between the shootings. So October 4th, uh, a woman named Caroline Sewell... She was 43, and she was actually in the parking lot of a Michael's store, a different one, in Spotsylvania, in Virginia, and she was putting her stuff in the back of her car, and somebody came and shot her in the chest. Now, she actually did survive, but she didn't see, you know, anybody, obviously. Now, because this was the second shooting that had happened in a Michael's uh, parking lot, because remember the first one where nobody got hurt, where somebody just shot in the window, that was also a Michaels. So for a second, they thought, well, maybe it's like a disgruntled Michaels employee. You know what I mean? Because at that point, they, that was like the only link they had to go on because it just seemed like everything was so random. Um, so they thought it was weird that it was like two Michaels, but it turned out like not to have anything to do with that. But they were just kind of clutching at straws at this point. October 7th at 8.09 in the morning, a 13-year-old boy named Iran Brown, uh, his aunt had just dropped him off at school and I guess what had happened was that he got in trouble on the bus and so he had gotten kicked off the bus like for a week or something so she had to like drive him to school but she had to drop him off early because she had to go to work so she dropped him off and at least in the documentary they show her like driving away from the school and she's listening to the radio and the radio is talking about the sniper case because obviously that was like all they were talking about and then she heard a gunshot and she turned around and her nephew was like laying on the fucking grass like he'd been shot. 13 year old kid. Now, she was a nurse, thankfully. So she like fucking backed the car up and put him in the car and took him to the hospital and call, even called the hospital ahead and said everything. So they, they did actually save him. Amazingly, uh, even though he was shot in the chest, like he was all fucked up, but he did live. So there was that like because the thing about it was that the round that they were using it's one of those ones that's like really it's it's fast and so like it goes in and leaves like a little bitty hole and then yeah it fucks up all your shit and leaves yeah. like a big huge exit wound. I could tell more about I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit more about this. I'll give you guys some a uh, little bit more of a fucking background to what's going on. They're using an AR-15. If I remember correctly and if the dates are right, it was probably a 20 inch barrel AR-15. I don't remember the exact brand. They had a lot of different brands out. Uh, you know, a civilian version of kind of like the M16A2. That's what they were using for if memory serves. <clears throat> five five six fucking is a cartridge about that long. If you can see me on video, um, the case is about big around as a nine millimeter pistol cartridge long. It's neck down to twenty two. 
it's fast out of a long barrel it's fucking nearly i think it's 3200 feet per second yeah coming out of the out of the muzzle that's what they said on the documentary okay the the idea was is that you can zero it for 100 meters and be able to shoot out to 300 meters and hit a man in the chest without any sight adjustments that way a soldier can just point and shoot and hit so that's what the velocity is all about there's no time for bullet drop Point of impact goes up and down a little bit, but it's only a matter of inches. It can reach out to 700 meters, but you know, by that time the bullets slowed down quite a bit. It's not as lethal. Most combat happens closer than 150 meters in in the military. All right, so 300 is a, 300 meters is a long shot. Up close, it's a very small bullet moving fast, pointed. It's and uh, it's hard. Okay. Um, up close, it's moving fast enough to fragment if it hits a person. So if you're using it indoors, it's almost like a hollow point. It hit, it'll hit and ex explode. Uh, especially if it's the lighter versions, like the uh, 193, the M193 round, which is what we use in the Vietnam. I think it was uh, 45 grains or 55 grains, something like that. I don't remember the exact bullet weight. You get all these numbers kind of go through your head. Later on, they were using a steel core version of it to give you a little bit of armor penetration. It was heavier. Um, it didn't fragment quite as well at long distances or is it up close um, at long distances it didn't you know when you're talking about 150 and beyond it wasn't fragmenting anyway just make a 22 caliber hole like an ice pick but it had a lot of energy if it hit bone it would fragment that bone and that bone would blow up like a little grenade inside you it caused a lot of what's called secondary wound tracks so Jenny says he got hit in the chest and he lived, amazingly. Not really. A lot of guys have survived that round, uh, especially at range. Up close is a lot harder. You know what I mean? Zero to 20 meters, zero to 25 meters, indoor type ranges. That, that, that fucking round will cut you to shreds because it's just a lot of energy. In a little bitty bullet, when it hits anything, it just kind of wants to blow up, you know? Well, I'm just saying amazingly because most of the other victims, a couple yeah. of them were were hit in the head, and a couple yeah. of them like it blew half their head off. Yeah, well, even for, even from you know yeah. 900 feet or something like yeah. that. But most of them were hit in the chest, and they were dead before they hit the ground. Like it's a like a little bitty, yeah. uh, you know, entrance wound. But the exit wound was just kind of like I mean they had the, they were interviewing a cop at one of the scenes and, it and he's shreds, yeah. he's just kind of like yeah, yeah I never saw shreds, nothing yeah. like that before. Well, okay, well there's it some things that are happening. Time. Shot placement is always paramount. It's critical. I remember back in the '80s, man. I was reading the rags. This is fucking pre-internet '80s and '90s. We would do what was called reading the rags, and for you youngsters, what that meant was, was reading magazines. And we had all these fucking gun magazines. And uh, they had a thing that was going on, which was the FBI one-shot stop statistics. They were trying to figure out what were the best pistol cartridges for law enforcement. The, not only the cartridges, but the particular rounds. Which ones were the most effective in percentiles, you know what I mean? And the one that was really winning was 3 to 7 Magnum, 125 grain jacketed hollow point. It was, it was clocking in at like 93% one shot stop in instant capacitation rates so dudes were flocking to that round and other rounds and they're looking at nine millimeter and 25 and boy we were all in these fucking hollow points and man I, in those days i would just thought that hollow point was just the most scientific thing ever you know and um because we had all this data and all this science and fucking wound ballistics and gelatin tests and everything you can still see all this shit on youtube they're making ballistic gel and shooting into them and fucking, what would that, you know, how effective would that be, blah, 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 blah. I was a big believer in the hollow point. Man, but you know, as time went on, we started, I started to realize it was a scam. What always, in, what always, the main fucking cause of fucking lethality is penetration. It penetrates through you. That's it, okay? What causes the one shot stop or instant capacitation is shot placement. Because really when you look at all this shit, 
anything that instantly incapacitates you pretty much would have incapacitated you no matter what you were hit with. Things that didn't incapacitate you wouldn't have incapacitated you no matter what you were hit with. It wouldn't have mattered. The reason why a 357 Magnum was fucking doing so well in those tests is because everybody who was reading those magazines were trained fucking law enforcement people. They were running to that cartridge because the magazines were telling them that was the most effective ones. So they were running to that one. Well, those dudes were better shots. The placement was better. That's why it was 97% or 96%. You know what I'm talking about? Or 92. I mean, <coughs> it was the shot placement. That's what was skewing all those percentiles. That's why I don't even bother fucking hollow points anymore. Just go full metal jacket. It's all shot placement. That's all. Well, it was the same with these rifle rounds. It's head shots. Head shots are always effective, especially with 5.56. Five, it's a fucking armored little fucking capsule. The, a high velocity bullet goes in there. It's pressurized now. And that pressure is all fucking contained inside that skull and it blows out the back. If it wasn't pressurized through the bone, the, the wound wouldn't look like that because the pressure wouldn't be as high. But anyway, all head shots pretty much are fucking instant incapacitation and death. You rarely survive it unless it's something very low energy like 22 long rifle out of a pistol or 25 ACP out of a short barrel pistol. There's not much energy there. Take 22 long rifle and shoot it out of a 16 inch barrel. There's a more energy. It's a more effective headshot. Now just because I said this for you guys who know what I'm talking about that doesn't mean you go out and buy a 32 ACP. Power, energy is still energy. And you've got to do, the penetration has to happen. You want 9mm, 40, 37 Magnum. You know, the, the cartridges that everybody that are using. 37 SIG, I'm not really sure that's worth it. And anything that's a rifle round is bad news. All rifle rounds are bad news. 5.56 five, that's using out of a seven out of a fucking M16 or 7.6239 out of an AK. Those are small rifle cartridges. They're still bad. You don't want to get hit with that. All right, and a full-size rifle round doesn't kill you any more than the, than a small rifle round. Death is an absolute. You can't be any more dead than dead. You know what I'm talking about? You just need enough to kill you, and a small rifle round is enough to kill you. More is almost wasted. So that's that was to the gun guys. They know what I'm talking about. So the 13-year-old kid, yeah, he was shot in the chest, but he did live, um, yep. and he uh, recovered, and he actually um, ended up testifying at the trial later on, so there was that. Now, interestingly, at this point, uh, there's actually documentary footage of the chief of police, Charles Moose. Um, he had been upset about the shit before, obviously, because, you know, his ass is on the line because he can't uh, catch these motherfuckers, um, but once a kid got shot, because he was 13 years old... Uh, he was up there and he was like tears like running down his face and he was just kind of like this kind of like this was fucked up before but it's like now it's personal uh, you know shooting a fucking kid this is fucked up He's, he didn't say that but like that's kind of like what he was getting at so uh, he kind of wanted to pull out of all the stops at this point so they did they really wanted to find some connection some clue some something because it at all of the crime scenes because you know people have been sniped from a long distance and from a moving vehicle um you know which they suspected but they weren't sure they didn't really find all that much evidence at the scene obviously and obviously there was no connection to any of the victims so they didn't really have anywhere to start you know random crimes are the most difficult ones to solve obviously so uh, so they did this kind of like this big sweep and they started, they did like that shoulder to shoulder where just we're combing through all the fucking grass and we're just doing all this kind of shit. Mm. And they did actually end up finding a shell casing and they found like this little spot where it looked like, you know, the, you know, they had, they brought in their own snipers and it's like, where would you go if you were going to snipe somebody at this location? And they started looking there and they did find like a little place where it looked like the grass was kind of padded down. And when they were looking around, they found a tarot card, the death card, obviously, because they had to be on the nose. Yeah. And this tarot card was uh, written on it was call me God Okay. on the front. And then on the back, 
it said, for you, Mr. Police, code, call me God, and do not release to the press. That's what he said. He's edge lord. Yeah, big edge lord. Now, the cops told the, the media, please don't like release this information. But of course, um, it leaked somehow. So they actually were made public the next day by a TV station locally. And then the Washington Post uh, ran the shit. So there was that. October 9th, 818 p.m. A man named Dean Harold Myers who was a civil engineer. He was 53 years old. He was shot dead while pumping gas at a Seneca gas station near Manassas in Prince William County, Virginia. Now, again, people were like freaking out. And on the, some of the documentaries, people said when this was going on, because this is only like a few days. You know what I mean? This is only like a few day span and people are just getting picked off in a, you know, a similar kind of area. And they're like, people would be like, they put ga- be c- putting gas in their cars and like bobbing and weaving. You know what I mean? Like nobody wanted to stand still when they were outside. Like people would be like coming out of a store and they'd be like fucking sprinting to their car. And they didn't, you know, nobody wanted to like stand, stand still anywhere because they were afraid you would get shot. And it wasn't like a crazy fear because that actually did happen. So yeah, this guy's just like pumping gas and he was shot. October 11th at 9.30 a.m., Uh, Another, like a businessman named Kenneth Bridges, who was 53, uh, also pumping gas at an Exxon station near Fredericksburg uh, in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. Um, Yeah, he was uh, shot also. He was 53 years old. October 14th, 9.15 p.m., there was a woman named Linda Franklin. She was 47. She was actually an FBI intelligence analyst uh, who lived in Arlington County, Virginia. She was in a parking lot in Home Depot with her husband they had just come out of home depot they bought like some shelves or something and they were in the parking lot putting the shit into their the back of their uh suv or whatever and the husband like went around to the passenger side and she was just down there and like the the sniper like just blew the back of her fucking just blew the side of her head off he said later that he was actually going to shoot the husband but then when the husband moved he said oh well and then shot her instead so yeah um, yeah, so at this point, as I mentioned earlier, a gas station started putting, like, tarps up, uh, you know, so people could pump gas and, like, nobody going by on the street could see them. Uh, so then there was a, a lull of five days. Then on October 19th at 8 p.m., Jeffrey Hopper, who was 37, he was walking out of a Ponderosa Steakhouse with his wife uh, in Ashland, Virginia, and he got shot in, I believe, in the abdomen. Now, his wife um, called for an ambulance, and he actually did survive. Like I said, he was fucked up also, but uh, yeah, he survived. Now, when the authorities were searching around this particular scene, in the woods, not too far from the restaurant, they found a letter that was like in a Ziploc bag. And this letter demanded $10 million dollars and basically said something like, uh, your children aren't safe. So, yeah. They, it was kind of like a ransom, but it didn't really have any details to it. I think it was just kind of like a terror type of tactic. Now, interestingly, because, as I said, there had been all these tips about a white van or like a white panel truck. So I kind of feel like the cops were sort of like focusing on that. And I can't blame the cops because like I said, these are a bunch of random victims and it's like there's really not any clues. So they're just like kind of jumping on any fucking lead they can get on. So at this point, like October 21st, they arrest two guys who had a white van who were outside of a gas station. I don't know if they were doing anything suspicious or if it was just like happened that they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But uh, they got arrested. Uh, It turned out that they were not the shooters, but they were undocumented uh, immigrants. So they actually had, they got cavity searched and then they got turned over to what was then the INS and they eventually got deported, but they were not the shooters. The day after that, October 22nd, uh, there was a bus driver who was 35. His name was Conrad Johnson. And he was actually shot at almost six in the morning. He was standing on the steps of his bus. This was in Aspen Hill, Maryland. And uh, at this point, Moose, the, um, the chief of police, Charles Moose, he released um, kind of a little bit of one of the letters that they had gotten from the shooter. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. 
So the bus driver, he was alive at the scene, but they took him to the to the hospital and he died later. Now, no shootings happened on October 23rd, but um, at this point, the they had their ballistics experts that actually did confirm uh, Conrad Johnson as the 10th fatality uh, in the Beltway shootings, like all from the same gun. Uh, they were all sure they were sure of that at that uh, that point. And uh, they found like when they were searching one particular place, they found a tree stump that they thought um, that the shooters had used uh, for target practice. So they were able to get a little bit of evidence there. So basically, okay, so at this point, obviously this is on the news like fucking 24 seven in the area. America's Most Wanted came out and did like a whole show because at this point the dudes are still at large and they're trying to like figure out who the fuck uh, it is. And as I mentioned, everybody, you know, as understandably, were like freaking out. Nobody wanted to be outside ever. Some schools closed. Uh, they wouldn't let it. It's like everything was canceled. It's like everything was just kind of like they closed everything up because you never knew. You could just be like walking down the fucking street or walking through a parking lot and somebody could just like blow your fucking hat off, which is fucking crazy. So uh, as somebody mentioned earlier, the Joel Schumacher film Phone Booth, uh, which was also about a sniper, uh, was actually supposed to be released around the time that this started happening, but it was pushed until spring of the following year because everyone was like flipping out about it, like I said. So, okay, so the main point guy on this at first was Charles Moose, as I mentioned, who was the uh, chief of police in Montgomery County. But then, because some shit had happened, like, over state lines, obviously they're going to bring in the FBI and the ATF and Secret Service and all that kind of stuff to kind of, like, coordinate. They had everybody working on this, like, fucking 24-7 because they really, really wanted to, like, fucking catch these motherfuckers. Um... Now, it took until, I guess it was, like, October 4th, October 5th, um, they linked, like, a lot of the crimes together. So, like I said, they did determine that these were all, like, the same person. They set up some hotlines to get tips, uh, which, you know, can be good, but they said, we got, like, way more fucking tips. I think, like, the woman on there said they got, like, 100,000 phone calls, and it's just, like, there's no way. So, like, I'm sure most of them were probably, like, fucking cranks. And... Again, like a lot of the tips talked about like a white panel truck or a white box truck type of thing with dark lettering on it. And a couple of them had said, well, we saw this like white truck or white van that was like speeding away from Leisure World where one of the people was shot. Um, And there were two guys inside it. And so at that point, they're just like pulling over every fucking white van that they can fucking find. And obviously that's not what the people, you know, ended up. That's not what the snipers ended up driving. So there was that. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the shooters did actually try to, they left like the tarot card and they left that letter asking for the $10 million. Interestingly, um, yeah, the tarot card was left at the one, but also they tried to call the police too, a few times. And the weird thing about it is that I think because they were getting so many tips and because it was such chaos like around this investigation, the couple times that John Muhammad called the cops and he was trying to like prove that it was really him, that it wasn't just a crank. And so he kept telling them, look into this other case, like this other crime, which was like in Montgomery, Montgomery, Alabama. And they did look into that crime, but it didn't seem to have any connection to, it wasn't the same MO in other words. So they were like, well, this guy just must be full of shit or, you know, it. so it seemed like, He tried to call a few times and it just, for whatever reason, it just kind of like kept slipping through the cracks, even though it actually was really him. Now, after they caught him or like later on in one of his letters, he actually said, oh, the last five people I shot, that's like on you because I asked to communicate with you and you like blew me off essentially. So he was like trying to blame the cops for, I was trying to talk to you and you wouldn't talk to me. So there's that kind of thing. Now, one of the calls, they did actually end up tracing it. Uh, that he made like they said okay maybe this is the guy so they trace it and it was a payphone at a gas station in uh henrico county virginia now when they got to the phone though there was nobody there although again there was a guy there like in a van (laughs) and so they those people got like arrested or detained but it wasn't them so yeah so as i said he yeah he talked about something that happened in alabama 
So, uh, so they looked into that. So I'll get into that later because there were like a fuck ton of other crimes they committed before this shit even happened. Now, interestingly, this is about when they got like a fucking break in the case. October 17th. Now, they found a footprint um, behind, or a fingerprint rather, Benjamin Tasker Middle School, which was where uh, Iran Brown, the 13-year-old kid, was shot. And there was a letter in a Ziploc bag, like pinned to a tree or something, like behind the thing, behind the school. So they were actually able to pull... Uh, a fingerprint and I believe some DNA like off of the uh, off of the bag. Now they matched that fingerprint to uh, Malvo, one of the shooters, the 17 year old. And interestingly, they were able to match that with a fingerprint from a robbery, like a liquor store robbery in Montgomery, Alabama. Now, the thing about it, though, is that his uh, his fingerprints were on record. See, I heard two different things. Wikipedia says that his fingerprints were on record because he'd been arrested. He had a prior arrest in Washington. But some of the other sources I read said, well, his fingerprints were on record because he was um, an immigrant from Jamaica. Like, he came there with, to the U.S. with his mom. So it could be, so it could be either thing. But, um, yeah, so his fingerprints were on file. So at that point, they had Malvo's name, like they knew who he was. They didn't know where he was, but they knew who he was. Now, because they had some tips, once they figured out that Malvo was, you know, it was his fingerprint, then they got some tips where people that knew him or knew about what was going on and said, oh, uh, if it's a two-man team, then you need to look into John Allen Muhammad because that guy, it's like, it's almost like a weird like father-son type situation they have going on and they're thick as thieves. And if Malvo's involved, then John Allen Muhammad or John Allen Muhammad is almost certainly involved as well. Like if it's two guys. So that's how they found him like that one fingerprint. Now, uh, they also got at one point one of John Muhammad's army buddies who actually lived in Washington state, they had, you know, they had served together. And like I said, I'll get into their history like a, a, a little bit, but they had served together. And this friend, as soon as he saw the news coverage and saw like the type of gun that was used and like the way that went about it and where in the area it was. And he's like, I bet that that's John Muhammad. And he said, he called the cops and said, well, I think the reason that he's shooting up all these in this particular area is because that's where his ex-wife lives. Like that's the area where his ex-wife lives at. And even then, like even his buddy, like his army buddy knew, he, I think he's targeting her, but like around the, the outside or around the fringes or to make it look like, I think he wanted to kill her, but he was trying to make it look random. Uh, you know, at least that's what they thought later on. So uh, they also found out that there had been a car uh, that Muhammad had bought in New Jersey, the Chevy Caprice. Now, they found the license plate at that. And uh, once they figured out what the license plate of that car was that he had bought, they realized that they had actually checked this car because every time there was a shooting obviously they put up you know like a roadblock and went through like all the cars and shit like that and this car the caprice had actually been stopped a few times but they didn't find anything in there um and it wasn't connected to any criminal activity so they just kind of like let it go so it had been on their radar they just didn't know like i said i'm not blaming the cops in this situation because this kind of shit is like really really difficult to solve. They weren't targeting anybody in particular. They were just driving all over the place, just shooting random ass people. Um, the car had also actually been stopped for a uh, minor traffic thing uh, two hours before one of the victims was shot, too. He had got that car. Running around creating mayhem. Yeah, that's essentially what. Ima imagine what a city would be like if you had six or seven of these guys doing this. Six or seven. Don't encourage up. anybody. No, I'm just saying that's the way certain things were going on like fucking Bosnia and shit it was that and a bunch of other shit layered on it at the same time <clears throat> this is a military operation this dude has a military back background he he knows he knows what he's doing he's creating mayhem but um 
That's just one of them. Imagine if there's a bunch of them. Well, yeah. You'd over you'd overwhelm law enforcement. You'd overwhelm the system. People would just be like uh, hunkered up in the house, fucking just going, damn, you know. Well, they kind of did that Which in this what, situation, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, very stressful. Yeah, and like I said, I, I was watching a couple documentaries about it on YouTube, and like there was some people in the comments that had lived in that area at the time, and yeah. they could remember what it was like. Yeah, and he's not even a trained sniper, you know. I knew trained snipers. I was in a recon platoon, you know, fucking... I was in one of the fucking recon squads. First 327 recon. He did get a sharpshooter medal, I think. No, uh, me? Or him? No, him. Him, yeah. Cause I, no, because no, I'm an expert. Expert, which is way above sharpshooter. But I grew up shooting. Our, the army shooting courses were fucking easy. All right. The only course that would have been challenging for me would have been U.S. Army Sniper School. But I didn't go. Uh, I didn't get the chance. But that, that's a challenging course. Tyler says, have you guys seen the Batman yet? This vaguely reminds me of something in that movie. No, we still, we still haven't. It'll be on... It'll be on uh, I mean, I wanted to see the Batman. I wanted to see the Northman. I wanted to see X. It's we got to see like, Norseman. Yeah, we got to see it. I mean, we just haven't been... We're still paying for that fucking movie theater thing. It's just like we never go. Well, so we've been away. hit by, from... We've been hit so many times by fucking bills and fucking scares and shit about new roofs and this and that. We've been fucking... Whoop hold up in yeah but i mean at least going to the movie that we're we already pay for that so you know what i mean never i mean you never told me to fucking pile up and get in a car i would have driven down there so i'm gonna put well i was good well i was gonna go see i was gonna go see x but by the time we got around to it it wasn't playing anymore okay i think the north man is still playing holy parish you know me i'll sit in there i'll sit in there and forget all about it yeah i know so but yeah, it's still, like I said, we're still paying for it, so we might as well like go to some. Just remind me, movies. whenever you're ready to go, we'll go. I mean, you got to pay for gas, but that's whenever kind of you're ready to go, we'll go. See, look, see how she's doing, people. She's putting I'm not it all do- on me. I'm not doing anything. Okay, it's like you're blaming me. I'm not blaming. Okay, when you're ready to go, just tell me. I'll drive us down there. Nope. Okay. <laughs> North Bay is good, says Holy Parish of Doom. Yeah, everybody's t- saying. I've heard go. that it was really good. I've been wanting to see it. Yeah, we'll go see it. What day is tomorrow? Thursday. Maybe we should see it tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, okay. if I don't have anything else. I mean, Saturdays, else Saturdays are usually better right? because I don't have any other work, but Thursdays might work out, too, if yeah. I don't have a bunch of We don't of have other... anything to do Thursday. We'll go Thursday. Well, I might. I mean, like, because okay. sometimes shit piles on, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't mind going down there and getting some of that Chinese food, too. Yeah. Okay. It's just I never really know because I don't know, like, what, what shit's going to pile on okay. me, like, from day to day. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, yeah, so like I said, they, this car had been pulled over a couple of times, um, but you know, for whatever reason, they didn't uh, catch them. So once they figured out who these motherfuckers were and what motherfucking car they were driving, uh, then they put out a media alert telling everybody to be on the lookout for this blue Chevy Caprice. So uh, basically, what ended up happening with that? was that at 3.15 in the morning, on October 24th, uh, the two guys were sleeping in the car at a rest stop near Myersville, Maryland. And a good Samaritan, who was also at the rest stop, recognized the car um, and called the cops. So the cops came, the fucking SWAT team came, they blocked off all the exits, shit like that. And uh, then they kind of swooped in and fucking got him. So searching the car, uh, they found a stolen Bushmaster 223 caliber weapon and a bipod uh, found in a bag in the car. And uh, this, you know, the ballistics test that they did, um, they determined that this was the gun that was used in at least 11 of the 14 shootings, uh, including the one in which uh, nobody got, like the one in the window of Michael's that nobody got hurt. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, attacks all carried out with a Bushmaster XM-15 semi-automatic 223 caliber rifle, which had been stolen uh, from kind of like a, I think it's called Bullseye, something like that, like a store. And uh, it also had a holographic weapon sight on it, effective at ranges of 300 meters. And what they had done with the car was that they pretty much... They had a thing in the back where um, I guess that John Muhammad would drive 
and then Malvo the kid would like lay in the back like on his stomach and would shoot out through they had like a like kind of a opening by the uh the license plate so he could shoot out the back and then they could get the fuck out of there so you couldn't so you couldn't really see you know no one was like coming up out the window and shooting or nothing like that they were shooting out of like a little hole in the trunk so that's how they were able to evade detection that's why nobody saw them because of that i mean they weren't like just out in the open or anything like that so once they caught these two motherfuckers uh they went back and um at first like they were they were talking to malvo and they said at first he seemed like real like he was kind of quiet at first but then like they kind of gave him some food and all this other stuff and then he started talking and they said at first he was actually like confessing to all the shit almost like he was like proud of it like the the really creepy thing was like the the one that he did the uh the victims that were shot like um the victim that was shot outside the home depot he said um yeah i targeted like there was this couple they were putting shit in the back of their car in the parking lot and he was gonna shoot the husband, but then the husband like moved and he went around like to the front of the car to put some in the passenger seat. And then like the wife was there. And so he's like, oh, well, I'll just like, it, he's like, oh, it only took me two seconds to like recalibrate, blah, blah, blah. So he was like really, really proud of it, which seemed like really fucked up. And he just like blew the side of her fucking head off. And he was like, yeah, it was a good shot. And they were like, okay. So yeah, there was that. But he started talking. And so they basically confessed not only to all that shit, but also to a bunch of other ones that uh, that the cops hadn't really linked to them prior. So actually, even though this particular spree lasted, you know, three weeks in October, they actually started killing people way back in February of 2002. Now, this right here, the first ones, the first people that they killed, this is kind of what makes me think that maybe this whole shit started because of John Muhammad wanting to get back at his wife somehow. Because most of the early shit they did wasn't like related to her directly, but sort of like indirectly, you know what I'm saying? But indirectly enough that it wouldn't necessarily all be linked together, if you know what I'm saying. February 16th, 2002. There was a girl named Kenya Nicole Cook. She was 21. And she um, was at her aunt's house. And I guess somebody came to the door and she opened the door and then Lee Malvo uh, shot her. Now, she was actually not expected to be there, I don't think. It was supposed to be just the aunt. Now, her aunt, whose name was Isa Nichols, was actually friends with John Muhammad's ex-wife, whose name was Mildred. Um, and they think that uh that isa was the person that was telling mildred to divorce him or like encouraged her to get divorced from him so i'm kind of thinking that maybe she was the first target but it wasn't the aunt that got it, it was the niece because she was there you know so i kind of feel like that was how that was supposed to go down because she just opened the door and they shot her now, in February or March, uh, Malvo said that they were actually out in California, like in L.A., which is not crazy. I mean, they did kind of like go all over the place. Um, and I think they did some in Washington State, too. So they were like driving. So this was like several months before they did the D.C. sniper shootings. February or March, he said that they had shot and killed a guy in a robbery, like a store, like convenience store or a liquor store or something like that. Now, Malvo did confess to this. It's like, yeah, we killed the guy. But the FBI couldn't figure out which particular crime he was talking about. So it's he, he didn't make anything else up. Everything else had a link to it, but they just hadn't haven't linked any particular crime to that. But so they think he maybe that they maybe killed somebody in uh, L.A. in a holdup. March 19th, 2002, a 60 year old man named Jerry Taylor uh, was actually on a golf course in Tucson, Arizona and was killed by a shot to the chest uh, fired from a long range. Uh, interestingly, John Muhammad's sister lived near this golf course, and John Muhammad was visiting her at the time this shooting took place. So again, it seemed like, it seemed like the first shit was personal, and then he decided he enjoyed it, so it's like, let's just go somewhere else and do like some random shit. 
I don't know. It just kind of like seemed like it was kind of. He did that up. first one, and then fucking, he, and then he shook it off. It got easier after that. He's like, uh, I'm gonna just go all the way. And he was probably he would have been linked to the first victim, so he knew eventually he'd become a suspect. So he's gonna go out with a bang. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. They might eventually catch me, so I'm gonna go ahead and go through this fucking plan. They don't catch me on that one, then I'll get away with all this shit. Yeah. But they're probably gonna catch me. That's what he's fucking thinking. I mean, it did take him a while to catch him, but like yeah. I said, he they were driving all over the place. I mean, right. this shit, they didn't link any of this because none of this was in the same area. They were going like one was right. in California, one was in like Arizona, one was in, like nobody would link those together. Right. But he was linked to the first one. Yeah. It was a friend of a relative, of his wife, or uh, yeah, the uh, aunt was so. a, the the aunt was a friend of his wife. Right. Yeah, the niece so. was the one that was killed, but yeah. Right. So. That set him off. He says, fuck it. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And he they probably think... thought he had a 50% chance of getting caught on that. Probably. Yeah. But maybe he did Well, and that happens with serial killers, too. Right. It's like they they take that first step, like killing the yeah. first victim, and then they get away with it, and that, like, emboldens them. Yeah. So I kind of feel like that definitely happened in this situation right. as well. Um... Okay, yeah. So the next one happened in May 27th, Denton, Texas. Now, I don't know if they're entirely sure that this has been linked to them, but uh, but Malva did confess to this one. Um, so, you know, there, there, I saw a couple articles about it where they're like, well, they're not entirely sure if this was them, but they're pretty sure it is. It was a guy, and this is a 37-year-old guy uh, named Billy Jean Dillon, and he was on his, just out on his property, like he had some kind of rural land out there, and he was just out on his property, like fucking around, and uh, was shot in the head from uh, a long distance. This case is technically unsolved, but because um, Malvo uh, confessed to it, they're sure that it's probably like a link there. Uh, because they did find some bullet fragments there, but it, they didn't, uh, the, it was inconclusive, so they weren't actually sure if, the, if that was related or not. August 1st, 2002, a, a guy named uh, John Gaeta, who was 51, he was actually, uh, Malvo slashed his tire, and then when, uh, when John Gaeta came out uh, of the store, he was in a parking lot, this was in Louisiana, actually, in Hammond, um, he came out and was changing the tire, and then Lee Malvo came and shot him in the neck. Now, the bullet went through his neck and came out his back, and then, uh, so he played dead. And then Lee Malvo stole his wallet. Now, after uh, Malvo had left, uh, John Gaeta, who was still alive, uh, ran to a gas station and uh, then went to the hospital. And he actually was fine. Well, I mean, not fine, but he recovered, like, completely. They let him out of the hospital, like, an hour later. So, uh, so he ended up being good. But he played dead, so he lived. Um, September 5th, 2002, 10.30 p.m., 55-year-old man named Paul LaRufa, who owned a pizzeria, uh, was locking up his restaurant in Clinton, Maryland, and was shot six times at close range. He also survived. What was it he shot with? Uh, I don't know. This might not have been, because like I said, they, Run um... that rifle. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That was just one that they used, but I'm not really sure. Yeah, it must um, have been some pistol. Yeah, pistol close number. range, that six shots, that dude wouldn't be, like, walking around. But, um, they, yeah, they did actually find, they knew that um, that this victim was one of theirs because later on when they caught uh, Malvo and Muhammad, they found this dude's laptop in that car, in their car. So they knew that uh, that he had robbed. So they were like robbing people at first too. Yeah. Like they weren't doing that later. Well, later they were just money for the campaign. Yeah, they were just sniping people later. Yeah. But like at first they were robbing people, like robbing liquor stores, shit like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, they needed money for this campaign. Yeah. To go on their fucking You're right road trip. Yeah, we needed gas, food, ammo, that kind of shit. So yeah, that's what they're doing. September fourteenth, two thousand and two. Uh, a guy named Rupinder Benny Oberoi, who was 22, he actually worked at a liquor store, and he was uh, locking up the liquor store. He was outside the liquor store, and he got shot in the back. Uh, he also survived. September 15th, 2002, uh, Muhammad Rashid also shot uh, outside of another liquor store in Brandywine, Maryland, uh, also survived, and he testified at the trial as well. So, you know, so a lot of these first ones, it, it had to be like a different firearm. 
uh, they're using in pistols. this one, I kind of feel like probably. And some people are like, well, why would you use a pistol if you have a rifle? Pistol's a lot easier to use from a vehicle. They probably pull up on them in a car. It's nowhere near as loud, okay? Even a good-sized pistol like 9mm, which is the standard, is a pop gun. Especially compared to a 5.56, five, like an M16. That's a pow! Ultrasonic fucking shit. Big crack. It fucking echoes throughout. If you don't want to call much attention, you use a pistol. From a distance, most, most witnesses who don't know what pistols sound like think it's a firecracker. Because that's kind of what it sounds like from a distance. But a rifle, no. You go, that's a gun. Yeah. Sounds like a damn lightning fucking strike. Echoes throughout the fucking area. So that's why they're doing that. Yeah, and I kind of feel like, and maybe this next victim, this is probably yeah. like answering our question right here. Yeah. Uh, September 21st, 2002, uh, 12.15 in the morning, a man named uh, Million Walder, Waldemarium, uh, who was 41, he was actually fatally shot in the head and back with a 22 caliber pistol. Oh, yeah. This was in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, he was actually helping out. There was, like, a package store, and uh, him and his the guy that owned it were closing up, and uh, somebody just came up and shot him. He died. Okay. Uh, explain this. If you When you look at the movies, you see these silenced pistols. They'll have, like, a 9mm or a 45 or the bathroom. Something. With a silencer on it. They're going to call it a silencer, right? And fucking dude shoots somebody and it's pink, pink, pink. It's like, man, you're hiding the fact that fucking, oh man, nobody even knows you shot anything. Yeah, bullshit. That's not the way it is. <clears throat> it's not called a silencer. It's called a suppressor. And a suppressed major caliber, like 9mm or 45, even if it doesn't matter, bullet weight or anything, if it's sub, as long as it's subsonic. A suppressed subsonic pistol puts out about as much decibels or sound as an unsuppressed 22 caliber pistol. So a 9 millimeter suppressed sounds like an unsuppressed 22. Well, like I said earlier before, everything has to do with shot placement. If you're good, and you're at close range, you don't need the suppressor. A 22 caliber unsuppressed pistol puts out the same amount of decibels or sounds as a suppressed 9mm. So if you, dr if you trust yourself in, at the ranges you're talking about in this mission, you can use an unsuppressed, 20, an unsuppressed 22 caliber pistol. And uh, the chances of someone really hearing that and identifying it as shots Especially at night, very excellent, very low. Now, there's a caveat. You suppress a major major caliber pistol like nine millimeter and above, you will hear it. Okay. Uh, it's not like you're hiding the fact that shots have been fired. People will know shots have been fired. But if you suppress something like twenty two. 32 ACP and 380, the minor pistol pistol calibers. Sometimes, depending on the construction of the pistol, you can hide the fact that shots have been fired. There are suppressed 32s and 22s and 380s out there where the loudest sound out of the whole firing process is the impact of the bullet. That that's making the most sound. That's pretty fucking impressive. Very impressive. Now, caveat. Most of those pistols are not semi-automatic. Most of them are a single shot. They'll take a semi-auto pistol and fucking convert it over to single shot to where it'll fire, and then you have to manually operate the slide. Because gas operation of opening the slide makes more noise. You'll hear that. So... A lot of those pistols were fucking modified to where you can push a lever up and it fucking locks the slide into place to make it a single shot pistol. You pull back on it, that that little switch falls, and then you let go of it and it'll fire a new, it, it'll chamber a new round, and then you push the button up again and take another shot. So that's what they're doing there. 
They just took a 22 and they used that because it's not as loud. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a suppressed nine millimeter. As long as the shot placement's good, it'll be just as effective. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Okay. So they so, do know what they're doing. This dude's an idiot. He's a fucking asshole, but he does know what he's doing when it comes to the firearms applications. Okay. So the same day as that shooting in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, 19 hours later, a 52-year-old liquor store clerk named Claudine Parker was shot in the chest and killed during a robbery in Montgomery, Alabama. This was the case that um, John Muhammad was talking about when he called the police, uh, you know, was trying to, like, prove that he was the real shooter. Uh, so she was killed. Uh, there was another uh, young woman working there, Kelly Adams. She was 24. And she was shot through the neck, but she lived. Now, as I mentioned, this uh, fingerprints they found at this scene would eventually end up linking up with, uh, you know, the fingerprint they found from one of the letters from the DC snipers. But it took like a month for them to make that uh, connection. September 23rd, 2002, 6.30 p.m., uh, a man named Hong M. Ballinger, 45 years old, shot in the head and killed with a Bushmaster rifle, which is what they used for the okay. DC ones. Uh, okay. This was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Yeah. Okay, Bushmaster. It's a good... That's, that's the one they used for right. all the shootings. Because earlier as on, I was saying, I don't know what brand they used. She just told me it's Bushmaster. I thought I said that earlier. But... Okay. Bushmaster is actually... Okay, the, the one that is used by the U.S. Army, especially during this time, was made by Colt under contract. Colt didn't design it. Okay, Eugene Stoner designed it when he was working with his company called Armalite. All right, that's who designed that originally. Okay, so Colt was contracted to make it because Armalite was a little bitty company. They couldn't, they couldn't make all that shit for the U.S. Army. Now Colt was a company that was up north, and they were kind of fucking. In, they were in a blue state. Okay, and they believed in gun control. They did not want to sell that rifle to civilians, even though it was totally legal. Uh, it fit all the all the criteria of fucking something that you could sell legally. There were a lot of other companies that sold things that were like that. Okay, uh, but Colt didn't want to sell it uh, to civilians. They came out with some target models, but that's an exception. All right, now another company appeared that made a clone of it, an exact clone. And Bushmaster and the Bushmasters were real good they gave you kind of what, what their selling point was is that they sold you a civilian legal semi-auto version of what the US Army had it looked just like it except for the markings they were real good real good so the Bushmaster was not a cheap rifle it was good um, now later on their quality kind of suffered during one of the gun band period the Bushmaster brand kind of got tarnished it, where it was really good and then it went bad and then it got better again. And, and now I think it's called Wyndham Armory. Uh, Wyndham something or other. It's been renamed now. But uh, yeah, good rifle. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so this la this shooting here, that which was the last one of the first uh, you know ones before they went yeah. to D.C. and did that kind of shit, was yeah that was the first one of the of that set that they used the Bushmaster that was what they used uh, yeah. for the DC uh, things and that was in Baton Rouge Louisiana which interestingly was where uh, John Allen Muhammad was originally from yeah it's funny because I didn't know they killed anybody in Louisiana they did they killed people yeah. all over the yeah. place all over the place and they might have killed more people they're not entirely sure I think yeah. their I think their kill count was seventeen that they right. know of. So they were just driving around shooting all kinds of fucking people. Yeah, they were just driving from state to state. Yeah. And like I said, it was 10 people in the D.C. sniper attacks, but they had killed at least seven people prior to that okay. that they didn't find out about until later on. So, yeah, so John Muhammad. So let's talk about these two motherfuckers' backgrounds. So John Muhammad was actually born John Allen Williams, as I mentioned, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now, uh, his family moved to New Orleans, uh, his mom, when his mom got diagnosed with breast cancer, and then she died when he was three. So his mom died, and then his dad left. Nice. Uh, so he kind of, so Williams kind of got left with his uh, grandfather and an aunt. 1987, when he was 27 years old, he joined the Nation of Islam. 
Now, I've heard differing things because Wikipedia said that he changed his last name to Muhammad in 2001. But another source I said said, no, he changed his name to Muhammad when he joined the Nation of Islam in 1987. So I don't know which one is true. Um, but it, I guess Probably it both. It doesn't really matter. Probably spiritually changed it in 87 when he joined. Yeah, it doesn't and really matter. But yeah, he joined the Nation of Islam in uh, 87. Yeah. Now, as I mentioned, he had been married a couple of times, and he had a wife named Mildred at this point. And they had three kids, I think. And he'd been in the military for a while, which I'll get into in a little bit. But from at least what I saw, like some interviews with some friends of his that said he seemed like an okay dude uh, at first. <laughs> You know, like he seemed, he was quiet and they said he was kind of like strict with his kids, but not like abusive strict. But they said when he came back from like being in the military, he'd done a couple tours. They said he wasn't really the same. Like they said he was a lot darker. Although his wife did um, eventually have to get a restraining order against him because of abuse and stuff. So it might be the case that his friends didn't see all of what was going on. But so she kind of like files for divorce. She gets a restraining order because she said that, uh, you know, now she's afraid of him. And they basically said, well, they gave the kids to her, obviously, because he was acting an ass. And so, as I mentioned earlier on in the show, he decides that he's going to take it upon himself to kidnap them. He not only kidnapped the children, he took them out of the country. He took them to Antigua. That was in 1999. Um... And then, well, the weird thing about it was then, like, later on, he came back, like, and he had to go to court for the shit. And, like, he really legitimately thought that they would listen to him about how he wanted, like, visitation and stuff. They're like, dude, you kidnapped your kids, like, after the whole legal process went through. And they said, you know, so it's like, why would you get visitation out? But, yeah, so, like I said, he was just kind of like, I, I don't know. A lot of his own shit was, like, himself only had himself to blame, you know. So he took the kids out of the country in 1999. And when he was in Antigua, allegedly... Uh, he started making money by doing uh, credit card fraud and also like making fake passports and ID for people like so they could immigrate to the US. So he'd do that kind of crap. Now, during this time period, he met Lee Malvo. Now, Lee Malvo uh, was just kind of a kid at this point. Uh, you know, he was a teenager. Now, Lee Malvo was Jamaican, actually. Um, so it was right around this time and I'll kind of get into his backstory in a little bit too, but they kind of developed like a father son type, uh, situation. Now, later on, like after they caught Muhammad, I don't know how much of this is like bullshit or not. Cause like I said, I'm pretty sure that his motive was one, he was a nutcase and two, he was trying to like get back at the world for his ex-wife fucking him over and taking his kids away or something. And he was just going about it in the most roundabout way possible. But they said, like, after they caught him, um, he said, yeah, like, Osama bin Laden, he's fucking awesome. And, um, yeah, those September 11 attacks, yeah, that was cool. Like, he said that he thought that well, he was that was good. War. He was yeah, war. that's what, like, yeah. So he did say shit like that. But yeah. they determined later on that he didn't really have anything to do with, no, like, No, he's got any, nothing to do with that. He, he just, didn't, yeah. Well, he saw that happen, so he thought it was time to rise up. But... That's also bullshit. He's making that ex he's making that excuse. What it really was is he wanted his kids back and he couldn't stand his wife and he wanted to kill a bunch of people he was pissed off. Yeah. He thought he killed a he was going to kill a bunch of random people cuz fuck them. All right. The the white devil, all right, and all this kind of shit. There was a lot of black nationalism involved in this too. The race was a factor. And then he says, "And one of the ones I'm going to kill is Max's wife and that would, then I'll get the kids." Yeah, because that's how that would totally work. Yeah, because when she's dead, I'll get the kids. <laughs> it probably wouldn't have happened. It probably would have gone uh, to the grandma. No. Well, yeah. It's probably what had really happened. Well, because she had filed, like, uh, yeah. a restraining order against him, like, right. and apparently she had, like, pretty pretty good evidence that he was, like, abusive. Right. Because they wouldn't let him have the kids, so there must have been a reason. Probably would have gone to the grandma. I'm imagining, yeah. Or uncles or aunts or something. Yeah, it wouldn't have gone to him. That's, so he, he's tripping. That's not how that works out. He's it's tripping. like, I have an idea. I'll just yeah. kill their mom, and then they'll have to give me the kids. Yeah. I'm like, no, they. that's yeah. not how that works. And I'm because sorry, I killed I'm all those sorry. other people, they never suspect me, because it's just all <laughs> random. 
That was his well, plan. Well, I kind of think that was his plan. Well, yeah. He yeah. said, like, well, it wouldn't be me. He, they're just caught up she in just, all that. Yeah, she just got killed by a serial well, killer. Serial Shit killers, happens. Right, yeah. It totally wasn't me. Yeah. Wait, I, you think I'd kill 20 other people for just to get my kids? No, never. Nobody would be that crazy. Yeah, yeah. that's what he was doing. That's yeah. how I interpreted what he said. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I, I agree with you. Yeah. I, I think that's kind of what he was he's camouflaging doing. himself yeah. amongst all those other murders. But here's the deal: no sane motherfucker will do that. No person who doesn't want to kill somebody won't will do that. He wanted to kill all those. Other yeah, people. you gotta want to do that. Yeah, he and, and he and he didn't and, and he didn't want to get his own hands dirty. He's got his lackey doing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's like I'm gonna so indoctrinate this fucking kid. kind of a bit of a fucking kid. coward. Yeah. He's a coward. Yeah. She should have done the shit himself. If he really believed in it, but no, he dragged he drugged this kid into it. Yeah, <laughs> who's doing six life sentences, which I feel bad for the kid. He was seventeen; he should have known. But not but shit, I was dumb at seventeen too. He probably fucking gave the dude a good line and filled his head full of bullshit. Hey, we're going to war with the fucking with with America. These white devils and this and that and the slavers. We're gonna fucking wipe them out. And fucking Osama's on our side, and see we're winning. We knocked we knocked down their biggest buildings. He probably filled his head with all kinds of bullshit. At seventeen, you might be you're going to be more open to hearing that kind of shit. Well, and like I said, the kid didn't really have a father figure either, right. and he was kind of like vulnerable also. Like I said, so not ex- looking up not excusing guy. it, but yeah. He's looking, and he goes, "Boy, he he's right, man. We've gotten we've gotten away with it, fucking all these times. He's got to be right. All the news is talking about us. We're winning." That's, I see it. I can yeah. imagine it. Yeah, I can too. And I can imagine being seventeen, thinking that you're that that it's all good. That yeah, we're yeah we're gonna win. Yeah, we're fighting the enemy. Yeah, I I do kind it's of. It's a lot like... more complicated than that, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every I'm solo in the middle. Everything Falcon is. Now. I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a lot more complicated. Please than that. don't like. Yeah. yeah, I kind of feel like right. everybody's like, oh, simple solutions. I'm like, yeah. nothing has a simple solution. Yeah, everything not just is black and white. Kid, everything literally. is it's everything not... is way more complicated yeah. and way more nuanced yeah. than. There's always <clears throat> always like way way more details. You need right. To always. Everything is way more complicated than you think. Uh, but yeah, later on, uh, Lee Malvo actually testified that uh, John Muhammad had told him that we're going to do that extortion attempt. Because remember, they left that thing, we want $10 million from the government or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, we're going to use that money and we're going to set up a camp in Canada and we're going to round up homeless kids and train them as terrorists. That was yeah. what he was going to do, was like do a terrorist camp. That's what he said anyway. I don't know if he ever. And they're sitting that. in there making moves on both of us, Jenny. Oh uh, yeah, in I saw that. <laughs> Go ahead and read what he said. Like yeah, it's a uh, American military 100. I'm just here for the pretty blue-haired chick. Thank you. It's purple actually, but close yeah. enough. Uh, just kidding. Back. I'm only here for pseudo leather daddy hunkin back sitting aside her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, I heard you, bro. We yeah, you. we saw that. Yeah. So as I said, his wife, uh, Milt, she was his second wife, second ex-wife. And she had gotten a restraining order against him because of abuse. Now, John Muhammad had been arrested before um, because when the restraining order was in play, uh, he had, a, like, they found him and he had a weapon. So it was a weapons violation. Because when you have that, when you have a restraining order, you're not, uh, you know, you can't have a weapon. So, so he had got arrested for that. Now, okay, so let's talk about his, like, military career for a little bit. So he actually enlisted in uh, the Louisiana Army National Guard in uh, Baton Rouge in August of 1978. He was a combat engineer. And then he transferred on to the regular (coughs) army in 85. So he was a mechanic, truck driver, uh, metal worker. Um, And as I said, he had the expert rifleman's badge. He's rear echelon, though. Yeah. Yeah. And he did several tours. He did one tour with the 15th Engineer Battalion, Fort Lewis, 1985. Yeah. 1981, uh, 1991, he served in the Gulf War. Okay. Uh, his company dismantled Iraqi chemical warfare rockets. Yeah. Uh, he got a bunch of um, service medals for that. Um, and then in 92, he went to Fort Ord, California, with 13th Engineers. 1993, back at Fort Lewis with the 14th Engineer Battalion. It's all starting to come in. I didn't know what, what units he was in. But now that I see, you know, those aren't bad units. Fucking the, the army in that, in that era didn't have bad units. But these are rear echelon units. These are support units. That's why he's got this kid doing it. All right? He didn't come from a fucking a unit of killers. 
this dude was from fucking one of my units, he would be behind the trigger. Dude, you're fucking bad for that. I'd beat, I'd beat that dude's ass. He's got the kid doing it. Well, he's dead now, so. Yeah, he's dead now. I'd beat that motherfucker's ass. He's got the kids yeah, doing it because he's not mad enough to do it himself. Yeah, he's just driving the car. Yeah, I'm just going to drive the car. You do all the shooting. Because you're small enough to lay in the back of the car. Yeah, full bullshit. I, yeah, I know. That's, bull, what I'm, I'm probably, that's probably what he told him, though. Yeah, that's what he told the kid. Bullshit. He just fucking... Um, yeah. Yeah, my fucking mind's fucking... I'm seeing lightning bolts now. Sparks and shit. <laughs> Could, being ex-army makes you want to fucking, like, punish him. You know what I mean? I, I, I know he's thinking, that motherfucker needs his ass beat. I'd stomp a shit out of the dude. Now he's got that kid in trouble. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which, as we were talking about before, yeah. had that kid not met this motherfucker, right. it's likely that he would have turned out okay. Right. But Right. Such a, you know... That's... If he was a real man, he'd have been back there behind that fucking trigger shooting him himself. So instead, he's got the kid doing it. Yeah. Not implying that, a real, that, a, re that a real man goes around like killing random civilians. No, but, that's not know. what I'm implying. I'm just yeah. saying, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about? If you really had balls, if you really believed in what you were doing, if you really fucking thought that you were on the right side of this shit, you'd be behind that trigger. No, he's got the kid doing it. Yeah. That, there you go. He's a that's fucking a, yeah, coward. That's what I mean. All that's right. fucked up. He can't even fucking face what it is that he wants to do. You need to get stomped for some shit like that. I got Bee's Nest in the comment. He's ex-army. Bee's Nest was stomped that motherfucker too. No, you don't fucking go out. You never... Here's the... This is just something that we fucking know. It's not just the U.S. Army. It's all professional armies. You never, ever, 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 ever ask a subordinate to do something that you will not do yourself. And I didn't see him behind any trigger. You know what I'm talking about? Not that we know of. It seemed like the kid mostly said that he did. I bet you it was the kid mostly. So. Maybe he shot one of those dudes in the back with the pistol. Like some of the early crimes. Some of the early yeah. maybe. To show the kid. But still. Why are you even involving the kid? What do you need him for? Well, I mean, why are you even doing this shit yeah, in the yeah. first place? Not gonna well, happen. no, 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 no. Let's go ahead and say this is something you want to do. All right. What, what's the kid there for? Why do you need him? You know. It's a crutch, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. This is... <laughs> I'm just saying, this is just making me want to fucking piss on a motherfucker. Well, at least you can find his grave, probably. Yeah. Outside the prison where they executed him. Fuck that bitch. <laughs> Yeah, so he got uh, honorably discharged yeah. uh, in 1994 with the rank of sergeant. So he'd been in for 16 years, uh, had several awards and blah, blah, blah. Now, uh, as I mentioned, that probably, like the defense attorneys, at least at the trial, were like they suspected that even though obviously he killed like a bunch of random people, that his whole thing, even though he made like a big show, and I'll kind of get into this a little in a, in a minute, but of he had like this big fucking plan of like kind of a terrorist type of plot but they're kind of suspecting that it wasn't that he was just mad at his wife for taking his kids away and was going to like punish the world because of it so they they're pretty sure that that was the ultimate goal whatever he wanted to dress it up as yeah. so lee malvo uh the younger of the two born in 1985 and he was actually from Kingston, Jamaica. Now, uh, so what ended up happening was that I guess like the the his mom and dad were not married, and then the mom actually left the dad in 1990. So when Lee was five, and then when Lee was nine, they he went off to live with his aunt Marie and stayed there for a year. And they said that he was actually, like, pretty uh, bright. He was, like, a really good student. He was, you know, shit like that. So he got into, like, good schools and whatnot. Now, he actually got baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church when he was 14. That was 1999. And then moved to Antigua, which is where he met uh, Muhammad. 
uh, his mom was living there at that time. And like I said, he was very good in school. Nobody thought anything about it. He seemed like a good kid. Now, uh, so right around 1999, Lee and his mom met John Muhammad in Antigua. And because uh, Lee perhaps had grown up without a father, because like I said, his dad left when he was you know five years old, or his mom left his dad when, when he was f uh, five, so he didn't really have a father figure. Um, so he started, I kind of, some sources said that, um, that John Muhammad dated his mom for a time. I don't know if that's the case, but he was just like always around, you know what I mean? And they developed a very strong friendship, like a father son, uh, type of thing. And I think too, they kind of approached him because as I mentioned earlier, John Muhammad sort of made his living making like procuring fake documents for people who wanted to like fake passports and stuff like that. So I think that, uh, that Lee's mom wanted to emigrate to the U S and didn't have, uh, the shit to do it. So I think maybe that that's how they kind of came in contact with him as well, because they wanted some fake documents or wanted some help getting into uh, the United States. So there was that. Cause like I said, Muhammad was an American. He was born in Louisiana. So, uh, so there was that. So later, uh, they went to, so his mom like went to Fort Myers in Florida uh, using the fake documents that Muhammad had made. Now she left her son back in Antigua with him um, and said, you know, I'll come back for you or I'll send for you like later on when I get like all the shit set Mama. up. Yeah, when I get all the shit set up. Um, now at this point, like I said, uh, you know, he's kind of still a teenager. And so in 2000, early 2001, uh, John Muhammad, you know, converts him to Islam because, like I said, he was Seventh Day Adventist prior to that, and started, uh, you know, and this is very grooming, very cult-like behavior. Starts um, like isolating him from his mom, you know, like uh, yeah, she doesn't want you, or she left, or blah blah blah, like that type of thing. So he's like, you know, I'm, I'll look after you. I'm like your dad, blah blah blah. So at this point, like Lee comes into Miami in 2001 illegally. And then uh, in December of 2001, both him and his mom were caught by the border patrol in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, now he got released in January uh, on $1,500 bond, but then he went, him and Muhammad went to like, and they lived in a homeless shelter, like in that town. Now he actually, enrolled in high school listing John Muhammad as his dad. Um, and then at that point, like I said, he was still going to school, but he wasn't really doing as well as he had, you know, when he was still uh, at home. Now, when they were in this particular area, this was when they think uh, that Lee stole the rifle that they would ultimately use uh, for the thing. He stole it from a place called Bullseye Shooter Supply. And there was a shooting range like next to the gun shop and he would go over there and uh, target shoot uh, him and him and his dad. Now, because he was technically an illegal immigrant and because John Muhammad was, um, had a restraining order, neither of them were legally uh, really allowed to own firearms, but you know, uh, obviously that didn't uh, stop him, did it? Because he just stole it from that store and that's what they ended up using. So as we mentioned before, um, when we're talking about motive, we kind of feel like, I mean, everybody kind of feels like um, that probably the, the impetus for it was John Muhammad, his wife taking his kids away and him not being able to get them back. And so he came up with this crackpot plan. Hey, if she's just a random victim of a serial killer, then nobody can blame me for the shit and I'll end up getting my kids. Now, the weird thing about it, though, is that when, like, after they caught them and they put Lee Malvo in jail, he started writing all this stuff about, uh, you know, doing jihad against the United States and all this other kind of stuff. So Muhammad had been, like, filling his head with all this kind of crap. But they said he also, they didn't take it super seriously because it's like he drew pictures of like, and I saw there's, if, if you see some documentaries, they show like some of his journals and stuff. And uh, he had drawn like these pictures of like Osama bin Laden and uh, Saddam Hussein and stuff like that. But then he was also like super into the matrix. 
and he had like characters from the matrix in there and one documentary i saw was like pointing out that one of the things that john muhammad would do allegedly was that he got him real into like that matrix kind of stuff just in a way that oh we're fighting back against the system uh you know and uh and maybe too like in a way oh everything's a simulation so almost kind of like deep trying to dehumanize people and he got him like really into like you know first person shooter video games and stuff like that what's well, a fantasy world yeah he, he was trying so he was trying to like get him to a point where it's like you're you're an enlightened person like they're all just you know NPCs. They're NPCs and fucking yeah they're all npcs yeah. he, he was trying to like get him in that kind of mindset which like i said they do that a lot with uh you know they try to like dehumanize try to dehumanize the enemy because it makes it easier yeah that's uh, not to just kill cults, that's military yeah there's like it's that's every, what i was gonna say they all always institutions do any that. anywhere that has yeah. to kill people um that's or what fight. they will do yeah that's what they'll do killing and fighting or resisting you always the enemy is the enemy. They're not like you. Yeah. You can't live side by side with them. Yeah. It's either you or them. Not to say that that's wrong. There are some situations where that's absolutely right. Absolutely. You know. Soviet Russia and fucking Nazi Germany could not survive side by side. Even though they had a fucking pact for a while. When they went at each other, that was it. It was either one or the other. Yeah. So it's not just, it's not just, you know what I mean? It's not bullshit. Just all of history is like that. Lion X Warrior says, geez, Seventh Day Adventist switching to the Nation of Islam. What a major, major head fuck. Yeah, right? That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, Malvo was raised Seventh Day Adventist uh, and went to school when he, uh, you know, when he was in yeah. Jacob. Now, look, I'm going to say something kind of in defense of Nation of Islam, which is in a weird way. Nation of Islam isn't about this, and it's not normal Islam. All right. Uh, Middle Eastern Islam rejects Nation of Islam. It, it, it's an American thing. It's uh, very much a cult. Okay. It's uh, a, a black nationalist, black empowerment cult. It's not all bad. It's a mixture of good and bad. Uh, there's. I kind of like Farrakhan. Uh, well, and Farrakhan came out and said, I don't he's a, yeah. I, no, I'm not. Right, right. Had nothing and to I, do with right, this right, motherfucker. Yeah. No thanks. Farrakhan's quite a character. All right, um, but I don't take Farrakhan seriously. Uh, Farrakhan is kind of like the black version of L. Ron Hubbard. All right, which L. Ron Hubbard, I like L. Ron Hubbard. Would I become a Scientologist? No, no. Was L. Ron Hubbard like a good dude? No. It's just these are the fucking entertaining things that happen out of li in life. You know what I mean? They've got life is filled with fucking characters. I fucking love Scientology for. The lulls in a, in a lot of ways, and I mean they're fucking they they come up with some wild shit, man. Do I want to hang out with Scientologists? Fuck no, they're assholes. <laughs> Every one of them I run across is a fucking well, asshole. Well, they kind of fuck up people's lives. Yeah, too. yeah, no, yeah. <coughs> but uh, you can time. sit back and listen, especially kids that are raised in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But you can sit back and listen to videos about fucking Scientology, about what's going on in there, and it's a fucking trip. All right. The world would not be very interesting if you didn't have people like this. You know what I mean? Fucking, they're just interesting fucking things, you know? Uh, was L. Ron Hubbard a bad guy? Not really. They liked him. He was an occult figure. Uh, was He did some fucking crazy shit, man, but... But he wasn't a bad guy. He wasn't a murderer or anything, you know? He was just... Not that we know. He was just wrong about shit. He was bullshitting. Yeah. Bullshitting a lot, which is its own kind of. It's bad. its own kind of thing, but it's he, he bullshitted a lot. And because stories. if you bullshit a lot, I yeah. mean, even if you didn't do anything yourself, I mean, that Later could on, that could lead to, to yeah, people other getting people take that shit hurt seriously. or killed. Yeah, yeah. So it's like he's not blameless. Well, I don't think he realized it, that would happen. That's true. I don't think he realized it. He was just uh, he was he was he, just trying to make a buck. He was grifting. Mm. Grifting in, in, grifting in his lifetime and spinning a narrative uh, that would fucking afford him the life that... But he died in a weird way. He basically died fucking in hiding, fucking talking to alien souls and fucking crazy, doing drugs, you know, with briefcases of money around everywhere. David Miscavige bringing in more briefcases of money. Here you go, Larry. It's a wild fucking story. Have another briefcase. Which is part of my fascination with Tom Cruise is that Tom Cruise somehow got fucking tied up in that wild ass fucking story. 
It's fucking weird, man. But the but the world is weird. All right. It is. So uh, I just wanted to say the fucking these guys here they really really didn't have anything to do with Nation of Islam and it, and, 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 well, nothing, and nothing to do with Islamic terror. They were their own no. terror. They were trying yeah. to. I mean, I think back and like I said, it. yeah, I think that was like something they came up with maybe after the fact or. <laughs> Like, Muhammad said that sounds yeah. like a good idea. Right, yeah. But, like I said, I think he was justifying after the fact. Because, like I said, you have to think this happened only, like, a year after 9-11. And so he's like, oh, everybody's, like, afraid of terrorists and stuff. Well, I'll show you terrorism. Yeah. And it's like, but uh, also I'll fuck up my ex-wife and yeah. fuck up her day. Like, you know what I mean? So I kind of feel like it was, like, a, yeah, justified after yeah. the fact. After the fact. Yeah. He was trying to like scare, but it, I mean, it is terrorism in a sense because you're terrorizing an entire community. Yeah, but it wasn't Islamic terror. But it wasn't for any political end, or a religious end, or a religious end. No, it had uh, nothing to do with Mecca and those is Islamic people. Yeah, he was just a, he was just a nutcase. He was just piggybacking onto onto that onto that during the during fucking uh, during a, the a, war against a time terror. of like heightened yeah, uh, awareness right. about that. So yeah. He had his own personal reasons. I right. don't think it had anything to do right. with that. But yeah. Um, oh, 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 oh. Let's see. All right. Yeah. So uh, so during the trial, uh, uh, John Muhammad's trial, Lee Malvo testified that John Muhammad had a three-phase plan. Like I said, I'm talking about this fucking terrorist plan. So this is three-phase plan. Phase one. Um, you're gonna like plan, map, and pr you practice around DC. So after the shootings, uh, you know they'll be able to like, uh, you know, very quickly like move on to the next location without getting caught. Now his goal in phase one, according to Lee Malvo. Hold on, they're tagging me for saying that it's a cult. No, Nation of Islam's a cult, but just because I say it's a cult doesn't mean cults aren't naturally bad or wrong or anything. A cult just is just a small Nobody's attacking religion. you. He said well said, Nobody's Tom. Nobody's attacking. All right. No, he, nobody's attacking you. Oh, okay. I thought it it says that. well said, Tom. Oh, okay. Well said. Okay. I was just saying that it is a cult. A cult is a small religion. They believe what they believe. Uh, I think it's a lot of the shit that they say is right. It's about empowerment and self-improvement. Uh, but that was the same thing with fucking Anton LaVey in the original Church of Satan. It's similar. Um, it's just black empowerment, black improvement. Um, I do think that there's an element of scam and fuck, of course, you know, people have got to make money, but that's just the way churches are. You know what I mean? It, it's a church. Is it Islam? No, no. It, it's an American creation. It's not Islam. Not really. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's really all that similar. No. I don't, I don't really know that much no. about it, but from what I've read about it, it's not really. My, my best, the best way I could ever spin Nation of Islam, is that it's, it's black Scientology, and Scientology and Nation of Islam have an alliance. They actually work together. They do, yeah. It's real similar. It's black Scientology. <clears throat> not to say that that's a bad thing. Some people might need that. Does the average motherfucker need that? No, you can learn that shit on your own. Okay, there's an element of fucking. There's an element of LARPing in all these religions. Well, some people like to belong that. to something. Yeah, they just want to belong to something. I don't. Right. I don't want to belong to anything. Leave me alone. <laughs> Fuck them. You can figure that shit out on your own. That's what, I, own. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like, And like I said, it's like, look, if I can't figure it out on my own, then who the fuck like some other right, motherfucker yeah. that's not me they're not gonna tell me anything about me you don't need magic clothes and special <laughs> haircuts and fucking buildings and all this shit to make yourself feel good you don't need that just nah, fucking you live your life as a person read some fucking books alright have fun have a drink for Christ build sake. yourself up into something you don't need them and it, the reason why that shit flourished back in the day is because it was a pre-internet era People were low information. People really didn't have anything better to do. <laughs> they didn't have much to do. Yeah. The flow of information was very restricted. Uh, you have the internet now. You don't need that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, honestly, just no. like I said, honestly, I would never go back to like, because now, shit, yeah. man, I can just, I was like, wow, I can just like sit yeah. around watching horror movies and writing scary stories and like making videos about it. And, all like, information. Thousands of people see them. And it's yeah. like, that's pretty cool. You can get that's all the information. Cool. You can buy th anything anywhere. You can meet anyone anywhere. You can make friends online anywhere. Fucking uh, find the local clubs where people are like you, where you can go fucking hang out and fucking party with them. It's just, it's, 
so the the scene has changed. These old religions and shit, fucking cults. That's one of the reasons why they're dying. It's just that they're obsolete. Internet is serving the fucking function that those used to have. If you understand what I'm talking about, you don't need them anymore. Well, I mean, the internet, like I said, it establishes its own communities, right. and I kind of feel like a lot. That's why a lot of people used to go to church, even if they weren't really all that devout or anything right. like that. It was like a community type of thing. Everybody go, and you, everybody knew each other, and you, everybody with similar interests and shit like that. But you don't need that anymore. Right? No, you just don't need it anymore. You don't need that anymore. Tammy says we belong to the cult of Pookie. Yeah, cult of Pookie. Cult yeah. of Pookie. Cult of Pookie, the entire universe understands Pookie. They see it and they go, yeah, yeah, that's right. All, all, <laughs> all faiths, religions, creeds, and races can see Pookie and understand the, the inner knowledge, okay, the inner gnosis of Pookieism. They see it and they go, yes, that is a Pookie. Where is Pookie? I don't know. She's, She's usually, like, out hanging out in here. Yeah. We might have, we should probably. Cats find break her. through all boundaries. Cute cats. Everybody yeah, understands that. Everybody, everybody understands that. Yeah. Pookie's mad at me because I only brushed her once today. Is that what it is? Yes. You were being stingy with the brush. Yeah, she's like, brush you action suck. was you not. You suck, mama. Brush action was every not time complete. I, every time I walk past that dress, yes. that dressing table, she jumps up on the sink and like looks at me and goes, bah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bah! Brush, brush. Yeah. And I'm just like, I can't right now. I don't yeah. have time. And she's like, bah! She asked me to open the closet door at least three times a day. She goes up the closet door, ah! and I open it. She just looks in and goes, "Okay, okay, just then, checking." Then, yeah, <laughs> fucking, crazy. fucking cats, man, are funny. She, she's a nutcase. Yeah, we love her though. She's like, so, she's so spoiled. Mm -hmm. She's so spoiled. But yeah, uh, so yeah, so what did I say? Okay, phase one. Phase one. Uh, the goal of phase one was to kill six white people a day for 30 days. So yeah, yeah. how many people is that? 180 people, yeah. like, all together. Yeah. Um, and then Lee said, well, that was phase one, but it didn't work out the way we wanted because of traffic. Okay. Yeah. And um, and we didn't get a clear shot or getaway routes, blah, blah, blah. Because, like I said, they didn't shoot. They just shot random people. Like, most of them, some of them were white, but some of them were were not white. I mean, some of them were, like, Indian. I think there were some that were, like, Hispanic. I think they were they were just, like, all over the place. Well, like I said, that's why the cops were having such a hard time, because they were like, well, this wasn't... It wasn't race. It wasn't gender. Which, you know, the people didn't have... They shot black people, though. Um, I don't think they did. Oh, I don't know. Did they? No, they just... They were shooting the general public, but they'd probably pass on black people. Maybe. Yeah, because I kind of feel like... Race is a factor in a lot of these. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like... But yeah, they they were like, we couldn't really determine... And they said, look, it's men, women, it's old people, it's young yeah. people. It didn't really look... But it just looked like a random psychologist segment. Will, psychologists will tell you that it's harder to kill a person of the same race of you. If they're another race, it's easier. Because you're, they're not... You don't identify with them as much. And I don't know if that's the same... I don't know if that's changed, but that was, that's what, what they used to say, you know, like, at least back up into the 80s and our 90s. Which, that's kind of what helped in warfare. If you're going to fucking war with another country that is also another race, it's a lot easier. It's harder if you're going to war with a country that is the same race as you. Like, England, you know, America versus Germany is a little a little harder on, on, on people. Because you're shooting a person that looks just like you. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of fucking... A lot of anecdotal fucking stories about Germans and Americans fucking drawn down and drawn down on each other, and they couldn't pull a trigger because they looked too much alike. You know, even during D-Day, Rangers coming up the fucking mountain, <clears throat> coming up that fucking sheer cliff wall to knock out those guns. They had Germans up there throwing grenades on them, and some guys, American guys, said they were climbing up, and a German guy pointed a fucking some machine gun right at me, but he couldn't pull the trigger. You know? Well, the thing about it, too, it might yeah. not... I mean, yeah, I'm sure race was probably a factor, but I think it's harder to, like, shoot somebody in the face when they're, like, right there, when you're, like, yeah. looking them right in the eyes. Yeah. It's much easier to, like, pick From people off, like, far away because yeah. it's... Yeah, it's, like, not a person. You're not seeing yeah. them. Well, like, I think we talked about this a little bit on the Road Rage show, too, that it's much easier to demonize somebody that's like in a car because you're not seeing them as a person you're yeah, just seeing you see an object yeah you're mad at the car then you see the person you know that's mad at him yeah so yeah. if i mean i kind of feel like right. hopefully mostly few people 
would be able to actually just go up to a random ass innocent person and just shoot them right in the face. Yeah. No matter what race they were. Um, just because you can see that that's a person. You know what I mean? You can look in their fucking eyes and see like that they're scared and shit like that. So, I mean, some people could because some people back in the forties, back in the forties when they were doing all those statistics during the World War II data, some of the greatest fucking statistical data was taken by the U.S. Army or the, or the fucking U, U.S. Armed Forces during World War II. They were taking IQ data. They were taking. They were they had in processing everybody. I fucking read. I fucking read a whole thing on it. That social engineering, a lot of what we believe, or at least back in those days, came from World War II and the, st- and the data that they'd compiled about IQ, race, everything. Fucking, back in the 40s, it would probably been easier to kill a person of another race. You didn't have mass media, okay? Yeah, you didn't, I, see, yeah. You didn't see foreigners that much. You saw somebody from another country, like a Japanese person, and you, man, what is that? You shot him, you know? And they were the same thing against us. They were taking fucking USGIs and cutting fucking... If they captured them, they'd do things like fucking string them up and cut their fucking genitals off and shit and make them eat it and fucking leave them out there and cut their heads off because it was easier for them to do. The Japanese were doing shit just as bad to the Chinese. And that's, from our point of view, they looked to be the same race to us, but not to the Japanese. They, they saw the Chinese as something totally different, okay? It was stronger back then because you didn't have telecommunications and mass telecommunications. Well, you're not exposed to people of like all races like all the time like you are nowadays. Exactly. So, seeing a person from another fucking race back in the 40s is like seeing an alien. You know, a person from another planet. You just didn't react to them the same way. It's not the same way now. You know what I mean? We just, we see each other all the time. Everything's normalized. Which is good. I'm yeah, like, I think it's a good thing. Fucking, right, we're all right. human beings. We can all crossbreed. Okay. Yeah. It's There's like not it's, a big difference. No, there, no. there are there are differences, but they're they're not big differences. You know what I mean? It's it's all just yeah, because, not really enough to write nah, home about. No, it's mostly just having to do with fucking what climate our ancestors fucking grew up in, what were what was being selected for in that area. Or yeah. sometimes, like, some races right. are more likely to get a certain disease than, than others. others. You're right. But it's, like I said, it's so not well. really that huge. Yeah, it's right. not that it's big not of a really deal. It's not really that huge of a difference. It all boils down, really, the future of mankind is all about who will you have children with. That's really all that matters now. Who will you have children with? Who will you marry and have children with? Okay, so, yeah, so phase one. Right. Uh, where they were supposed to kill 180 white people. They said, yeah, heavy traffic, um, put the kibosh on that. So they right. just go, Which, like, I know that's fucked up, but it's like, that kind of made me laugh. Like, when I read that, I was like, really? You had this big terroristic plan. We're going to kill 180 white people. And, well, the traffic was bad, though. I mean, come on. It's just like, it just sounds like such a lame-ass excuse. But anyway. Uh, so phase two was going to take place in Baltimore. Now, this had, was never done. They did kill some people in Maryland, but this was phase two apparently didn't take place. Uh, the first part of phase two was they were going to kill a pregnant woman by shooting her in the stomach. That's okay. Uh, and then the next one, they were going to kill a cop, like a Baltimore cop. And then at the funeral of the cop, they were going to like put a bunch of bombs so they were gonna like blow up a bunch of other cops like at this funeral so it, clearly they've like thought a lot about Janet said that they did kill some black people yeah I thought that there was I thought that it was kind of like all across the races I remember yeah. like a couple um a couple Latina women I remember uh one or two guys that were I think Indian and yeah I remember like all kind of all different races so I just couldn't remember, like, off because there were so many. I just couldn't remember offhand. But I just remember it being, like, well, that's why the cops, like I said, were so confused at first because they're like, well, we don't think this is racially or gender motivated because, or age motivated or whatever. It's just because it's just anybody. They just killed anybody that they could, uh, that they could get to. And like I said, I think sometimes that they just kind of, like, set up in a spot and then whoever kind of happened to walk along. So I think a lot of this stuff about oh, we're tar- only targeting white people and stuff like that, uh, obviously that wasn't true. I think they were just targeting whoever happened to walk in the area that they were at. Uh, and then phase three, which they did actually seem to like they tried to do, but this was, phase three was when they were going to extort uh, all the money from the government. 
And they did try to do that with the letter that they put in the Ziploc bag, even though, like I said, even if they really did want the $10 million, they didn't like leave any instructions or anything. They were basically saying, I think they were trying to like blackmail. They were saying, well, if you give us $10 million, we'll stop killing people. I think that's what, but like I said, they didn't have any details. It wasn't like a ransom where they're like, hey, meet me at this X, Y, Z and like leave a briefcase full of unmarked bills or whatever. They didn't do that. They just said, hey, we want $10 million pretty much. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, they wanted this $10 million to set up a terrorist training camp in Canada. They're going to take all these like homeless kids from like the YMCA and stuff, and they're going to like train them to go to war like against the United States. Like I said, I don't think they were actually going to do any of this. I just kind of feel like John Muhammad was a crazy person, and I think he came up with some of this stuff just like, I don't know. He just seemed very fantasy prone and like that kind of crap. So, yeah. Um, September 2003, John Muhammad uh, sentenced to death. And a month later, Lee Malbo, who was a juvenile at the time of the crimes, got sentenced to six consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. November 2009, John Muhammad was uh, executed by lethal injection. Now, in 2017... Uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals vacated Lee Malva's three life sentences without parole in Virginia. There was an appeal uh, where they were going to do a resentencing because there was a Supreme Court ruling um, that said that mandatory life sentences for juvenile criminals without possibility of parole violated the Eighth Amendment. That's what it was that I was thinking of. It wasn't so much like life sentences, but it was life sentence without parole if the person was a minor when they committed the crime. Like, they thought that that was uh, unconstitutional. So some of his life sentences got uh, vacated. So there was that. But at the moment, um, Lee is still in, uh, ha still doing multiple life sentences at Red Onion State Prison in Virginia, which is a supermax. Now, he will be eligible for parole in 2022 in Virginia, but he also has some life sentences in Maryland, which have not been affected. He has actually tried to appeal those, but so far that hasn't gone anywhere. So like I said, even if he was eligible for parole in Virginia, I think maybe, I mean, wouldn't he just be imprisoned in Maryland then? Because like I said, he they killed people across multiple states. I'm not sure how the, the- You have to deal with each, each state That's separately. what I'm saying. Um, uh, so that law was like, not that right. was just on the books in Virginia, not in Maryland. Yeah. So I'm not sure how that would, because he's up for parole this year, apparently, but I don't know if he'd ever get it because he has so many life sentences that have to do with different states and different laws. So I'm not really sure how that would work out. Now, interestingly, uh, to, in 2012, during a an interview with Matt Lauer, of all people, Lee Malvo said that he was sexually abused by John Muhammad, hmm. which, not crazy. I mean, this does sound like a grooming type of situation, so... Okay, groomer. No, I'm just saying... Not okay, boomer, but okay, groomer. I'm just <laughs> saying that it... I mean, yeah. the way that it's... I'm not saying Maybe. that it happened. Maybe. But it wouldn't surprise me. Maybe. It wouldn't surprise me. Uh, actually, he got married, Lee Malvo, in uh, March of 2020. So he got married in prison. I don't know what his wife's name is. Now, he has since uh, apologized for what he did. Um, written letters to all the victims, given interviews to the media. And one of the quotes uh, that he said in the media was, I was a monster. If you look up the definition, that's what a monster is. I was a ghoul. I was a thief. I stole people's lives. I did someone else's bidding just because they said so. There is no rhyme or reason or sense. So... <sighs> I don't know. Like I said, he was a kid when it happened. I don't love it. I don't love the fact of, I don't, I don't love the idea of him running around. Done 20 something years, almost 20 years. Yeah. I don't know. How old is he now? Close, pushing 40, huh? I mean, he's got to be. If he was 17 yeah. in 2002. He's about 36, 36. So, yeah, 36. So he's almost 40. So he's almost 40. Yeah. That's not the same person anymore. He's out of the danger zone. And they did say that he actually seems like a different person. Now because, but, and, and, but the thing about it is that, I don't know, since he spent so much time in prison, it's like, could he really be... They'd really have to work with him a lot. Well, he, he's married, right? Yeah. He has people that can fucking help him 
reintroduce himself. I guess. Yeah. He'd have to change his name and fucking yeah, shit like I that because no one's gonna. He'd have to move somewhere else where nobody knows who, who the fuck he is. Yeah. Just like some of those fucking. Yeah, because no one's gonna give you a job or nothing. I mean, he's not the same guy. No, but, you know, and the thing about it is like people was like. He was a juvenile. Yeah. Janet said, I think he needs to stay in the pen for a while yet. Yeah, maybe. He's maybe. 40 almost. Well, maybe they should wait a little bit longer. It just doesn't seem like it's been long enough. I don't know. I mean, that's really fucked up. Yeah, he was dumb. He was 17. But for Christ's sake, when I was 17, I was stupid when I was 17 too. But nobody's going to talk my ass into going around shooting random ass innocent people. Fuck, man. Come on. From a different background. You should know better. Yeah. I know, but anybody should know better. Anybody should know better. Any Every fucking person in the world knows that that's bad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that was him then, though. This, I'm just saying, he's fucking 17. <laughs> I can't, There was a lot of shit I did at 17 I can't really relate to. Uh, yeah, but, but you didn't do anything like this, no. did you? No. Okay, I was going to say. No. <laughs> it's like some shit you didn't tell no. me about. Fuck, man. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Because it's like, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a big fan of like... Had he done this shit in his 20s? I said, no, let that motherfucker rot in hell. But, because uh, there's a big difference between tw- uh, 17 and 22. Big difference. Yeah. You come up real quick between in that period. He's kind of gray. I think I'd, I think I'd let him go around 40. But I keep an eye on him. Yeah. It's that other dude. Young guy and that dude's foot. dead. Yeah, now, he's dead. So. Yeah, I mean, he, was, he seemed the, he seemed like he was the mastermind. Yeah, he he had that dude pumped up into thinking all kinds of bullshit. I don't know. See, we get into this every time yeah. that, like, like I said, when we talk about like serial killer couples and stuff like that, because usually there's like a kind of a similar dynamic going on sometimes with that as well. Yeah, and I'm always just kind of like I always try to think. I don't I don't want to like excuse what they did, but then I'm like, well, if this person had never met that person. Would they have done this shit on their own? I don't think this kid would have done that shit. I don't think it would have occurred to him. But uh, maybe there's something merciful about me. I can't believe it. <laughs> that's what I'm gonna say. Maybe I can't believe you're like fucking like, arguing because, for letting it. Because uh, usually it would be uh, the opposite. Because there's because remember the fucking dude. I'm not saying they should fry him or nothing, and I'm I'm not saying they should never let him out. I'm remember just the saying, gay dude that was killing all those fucking people, tying them to the boards and putting the glass rods up their dicks and fucking killing them and shit. And he had the young who fuck, Dean Coral. Dean Coral. Remember Dean Coral, the Candy Man. Yeah, yeah Candy Man. All right, Dean Coral had to fuck that bitch up because he was fucking old enough to know. But then he had that teenage dude fucking yeah going getting victims for him. What was that guy's name? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. We did a show about remember that. Him? I can't remember it offhand, but yeah, I know who you're talking about. I think that dude did enough time. I'd let him out. That's yeah, right. and I mean, yeah. Because the thing about it, yeah, I, I'm, dude, I think I think there are a lot of it had to do with it. Had to do was afraid of Dean Coral. Yeah, that's why it. I'm willing to give you like a lot of leeway right. if he was you got dude. sucked into something and you were afraid of that person and, and you were it, afraid it snowball. If you fuck them go. over, then right. they might kill you and shit like that. So right. you were like afraid to escape and, and shit like that. Dean got that dude to give up one kid, which fucking made him guilty enough and feel to feel trapped that he gave him up another one and another one and another one. And another. So that, if you ask me, that kid, that kid was abused. All right. And he did eventually man up and kill Dean. So I wouldn't, I would have let him go. And I think we said that on the show that yeah. it's like, I'm not excusing what he did when he no. was, but one, I could see how it could have happened because he was pretty young. And yeah. two, he did actually kind of redeem he, himself by he, killing them. He killed Dean. He did, yeah. I fucking would have gave him a couple of years. I'd have given him five or six years. But I'd put him in a, some kind of fucking mental place. Yeah, I mean, he needs some like right. counseling. Because he was, he was a victim. Really, if you ask me. I think he was a victim. And then I would have fucking changed his name and fucking snuck him out the back door after about five, six I mean, you'd have to. You'd have to change his whole identity. You'd have to move somewhere where nobody knew him. Because you wouldn't be able to have a normal life when somebody found out who you were. No. If you ask me, that kid was one of Dean Curl's victims. All right. So, but I I can't understand. I'm not a fucking, I don't have a great faith in in, in any criminal justice system. It doesn't matter the country especially the United States, it makes a lot of mistakes and it's just fucking, it's a little brutal, all right? 
It's not very intelligent. It's just kind of fucking, well, this is what it says, so this is what we're going to do. And we're like, yeah, but, you know, it doesn't quite apply to this particular dude. Yeah, this I mean, a, everything has to be, yeah, like, taken on yeah, an individual case-by-case right. case basis. Right. Because so, everybody's different. Every right. situation is different. I would have sent that kid to a rehabilitation thing for about fucking five to ten years. For observation and to fucking chill that dude out to get him to some fucking mental help. And then fucking changed his name and reintroduced him into a society. He killed Dean Coral. Eventually. Okay. Like I said, that kind of redeems him in right. my eyes. Because at least, like I said, it's not great what he did, obviously. He fell in the hands of a monster. He who, did. Who fucked him up and fucking lied to him and got him to do things. And he turned him into an Igor, you know. And, and you got a lot of people who will fucking say, well, that never would have happened to me. Bullshit, you weren't there. And you weren't that kid's age. Yeah, see, don't. And you weren't yeah. that, you know, fucking that, that's, it's, it was very It's hard to say. You, and, yeah. Well, and like I said, yeah, maybe you wouldn't have done it, but you're not that person. You're not that particular. That person's circumstances, right. that person's personality is that completely person different. That person might not have been quite as intelligent as you or that kind of shit, you know what I mean? He was able to fucking fall prey to that. So, no, I, you know, it's, it's not a one size fit all, fits all. That's why I'm not really big into this mandatory minimum sentencing shit and a lot of shit that the, that the, U.S. criminal justice system does. The judge, the judges, first of all, judges have to be a good, good quality judges, and they have to have the leeway to make a fucking decent decision on a, on how to punish somebody, you know. And I, I think a lot of the judges, their hands are tied on how to, at least in the U.S., on how to punish somebody or how to fucking find justice, you know. We're like this. This one is more victim than this guy here is more victim than perpetrator. We're gonna put him into a place we're going to try to fucking rehabilitate him you know i mean that's that that's the way I'm. yeah saying. i mean they do kind of like it does seem right. like they do try like they right. do have like sort of mitigating circumstances and stuff like that but yeah i don't really like that whole you know mandatory sentences right. and, and because this happened, three strikes above give like, him this and yeah see right i don't here. like that because that's yeah. like that's too one size fits all everything right. and i know it's harder and i know it takes more time and blah 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 and more money probably but it's just kind of like every situation is different you have to approach everything well that's what yeah, you have, have judges a, for that's what i mean that's have a set a of guidelines for. yeah don't but put, don't put handcuffs on the damn judge that's what a judge is for is to try to figure out justice but when you hobble the judge with these all this mandatory minimum bullshit, then what do you got the judge for? What's he there for? Yeah, there doesn't really you seem know, to be. That's what a judge is for. You don't trust the judges? Well, fucking, you better fucking change your criteria of who a judge should be. But you, you know how these systems are, man. It, they're corrupt, and it's a bunch of politics, and it's a bunch of people fucking whining and crying, and fucking everybody's fighting each other, and... You're going to end up with a dysfunctional system, you know, and just, just how it is. I don't agree with it, you know, but we have to, we have to recognize what it is. It's, you know. Everything has to be yeah. taken on a case by case basis, yeah. like I said. People are saying agree, but we don't know what you're agreeing with, baby. Lion, yeah, okay. well, yeah, what, okay. what you just said. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Lion X Warrior said, I still can't get my head around why we still imprison nonviolent offenders with violent offenders. Yeah, I don't really get that either. Yeah. Um, yeah, Janet said, our judicial system is not fair. A man in Iowa got life for third strike, uh, for stealing bread. So, yeah, see, that's why I don't like that three strikes law. Because, like I said, if you do three minor things, oh, suddenly you're in jail for life, even though it's just, like, stupid minor shit. Right. Nonviolent crimes, honestly... I, I don't even know if you should do jail time for that. Or, or just like fucking minor jail time or fines or something. One of the biggest fucking problems was the war on uh, war on drugs. Well, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it in other programs, but my mother was a DEA agent, okay? And when DEA fucking was tasked with that shit earlier, they were like, wait a minute, hold on, no. We, the, the, really what's best is this fucking rehabilitation programs. When the crack epidemic hit... But for, and Biden was one of them. He's your president now. He was one of the fucking many who wanted to fucking crack down with the three strikes you're out thing. Biden did the three strikes you're out thing, and and cracking down on these drugs. And when they cracked down on the fucking drugs back in the '80s, all it did was just create drug cartels and offenders that were willing to kill cops uh, over a, a damn near worthless drug. But they made that worth. They made that worthless drug into gold. 
But then rich people got richer on it. And drug cartels came, which, and then the cops got fucking rich on it. And the state got rich on it, fighting it. So it makes you wonder, did they know what they were doing? I think, I kind of think they did. I think they said, we're going to make a whole new industry out of this. Dumbasses. Because they didn't give a shit about us. <laughs> They'll kill you, get you killed in a fucking crossfire between fucking drug cartels or... You're a cop and you're getting shot over because some dude shoots you because he doesn't want to go to jail for 50 years for having a bag of little white bullshit in his fucking pocket. It's just fucking stupid. Stupid. And drug prohibition is not American. It's not American. You go back and look in history of the 1800s, man. They had what was called the right to bliss. They... Cowboys and all these guys from the old west is American and fucking his mom apple pie and Chevrolet the cowboys and shit we're doing cocaine and and morphine and weed and fucking booze they 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 did all that there wasn't anything again there wasn't any laws against that now you can say well you can't have all these high people driving cars well we got laws against that drunk driving and fucking driving under the influence you could you can legislate that. But as soon as you start with all these fucking, we're going to give you fucking life sentence for fucking having heroin and shit. Well, these, now all of a sudden these dudes are willing to kill over it. And the fucking price of heroin goes to the roof. You're going to make fucking empires built on heroin and shit. It's dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Bad. Should have made that shit a misdemeanor and all the money gets sucked out of it. Yeah. Like I said, I've, I've, always, away. I've always been a big advocate of uh, le or at least decriminalizing yeah. all drugs yeah, and, and, pro and prostitution. As Decriminalize well. and regulate. That will get rid of a lot of uh, problems yeah. Yeah. because you no longer have. Uh, that's the thing, too, is yeah. like drug dealers, because their business is uh, illegal. Like if they have a beef with like some other drug dealer, yeah. then they're going to handle that uh, right. extrajudiciously. Right. Let's call it that. As soon as it's not that illegal or the penalties aren't that high, the price of their of their product starts plummeting. Which means, and then the time that they have to serve for, for, for selling it fucking goes down. So then all of a sudden, there's no impetus to shoot one another. Yeah, because it's not worth it. It's not really worth it. Like all, I said, you don't see people shooting each other over fucking cigarettes or vapes yeah, or, exactly. or booze. Exactly. Because there's, there's no reason you're not going to do any time over it. And there's not any money involved in it, so nobody gives a shit, and it just it becomes a non-issue. If you make it an issue, it becomes an issue. But I think they made it an issue because they wanted it to become an issue because they wanted to make money with it. Uh, you know, just like it wouldn't surprise me if our ruling class is heavily invested in it. You know, make a lot of money. Mexico's ruling class is so. Leads me to believe that America's ruling class is heavily invested in the drug cartels. Why not make black funding? And I bet you the government is. They've always said the CIA makes a shit ton of money on it. Wouldn't surprise me. If it ever came out that fucking CIA was fucking running all these drugs and shit, making all kinds of money, black funding to fund their projects, and then they pocket it to buy mansions and pools and shit. If they ever came out, I'd be like, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Because other countries are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Murder Hornet returns. Federales almost caught me today in Mexico. It's because you're going through the fucking customs fucking talking shit. And you don't, you're don't. you not carrying anything. But you're making them think that you're carrying anything because you go through their fucking drug. All right? Leave them alone. Stop fucking with them people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the fucking Mexican cops are going to lock his ass up for being drunk going through fucking customs. And leave them hookers alone, man. <laughs> Motherfucker sends me fucking clips to his phone. I think I'm gonna fuck this one. Some fucking pretty ass Mexican girl with her booty up in the air, sitting in the front the fucking window. Is he like asking you for his opinion on like? Yeah, he asked me opinion, which one. Like, which one? one He's asked me to choose one for him. Did you? Do you do it? A long time ago. <laughs> long time ago. Pretty ass Mexican girl with her booty up in the air in the fucking fucking front window of the place. He's like, should I should I go ahead and hit this one? And I look at it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> And he's in Mexico. Damn. <laughs> he needs me here in Florida to tell him which one of these Mexican hookers the fuck. I can't understand this. Well, he shit. wants your opinion. He wants my like, opinion. Which he one? He trusts your taste, he I guess. He trusts my taste, yeah. I guess so. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. 
Dudes are ridiculous. Dudes are ridiculous. Are I think ridiculous. it's just ridiculous, and I'm on the I'm on the receiving end of it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is ridiculous. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, we've been going three hours. I, yeah. Now I guess I'll, I'll make us something to eat. Ooh, we're making food. Yeah. Cause yeah. I'm, cause I'm, I got some chicken down I'm there marinating. Hungry. Oh, that's right. And would you want some of that? Uh, make uh, get some Indian rice going. Okay. You hungry? Yeah. And then I'll make fucking chicken tandoori because I got that tandoori chicken sitting back there. Fucking. It's uh, marinating. All right, that sounds good, sounds actually. Good. Yeah. It's just thighs, that's all I got. That's my favorite part. Okay. okay, all right. Everybody knows I like thighs on the chicken. Well, the uh, the drumsticks might be thawed, but they haven't really been marinated. I could just cover them in marinade and fucking cook those in the same way. I mean, either way, like okay. I said. I mean, right. thighs are good, legs right. are good. All right, let's go. All right. I got it. All right. So thanks, everybody, for dropping by this evening. This yeah. was actually a pretty good show. I didn't get too fucked up, so I was actually able to... Tammy says a really good show tonight. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Kept kept most of my notes on yeah. on point, which is good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you guys had a good time. We will see you guys on Friday night for the sidetrack show, where we're just gonna drink and talk about what the fuck ever we feel like. Uh, so thanks for dropping by. Have a good rest of your night. Have a good day tomorrow, and we will see you guys on Friday evening. Bye.